I need the mic for this? I thought yes, I was doing a good do. Okay. Good evening, everybody. This is a meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, before we start, a couple of announcements. There are two postponements. Uh, the first one is Salon Greenwich at 100 Melrose Avenue. And it is was item number three originally on the agenda. The second postponement is item number seven, Greenwich Hospital and RFK Enterprises at 35 River Road, I believe that was. Oh, and that was withdrawn completely. Um, the second announcement is that Victoria Goss is seated for our vacant position. And finally, uh, for those of you who are here for Greenwich Academy, um, of those applications, we will have a sign-in sheet uh, that's somewhere, Katie, that's over there. Uh, just so we know how many people are going to speak and who's going to speak, but uh, you know, you'll have your full opportunity to speak. And, and no decision on it. Oh, okay. And in case anybody doesn't know, uh, we will not be deciding the Chabad Lubavitch item this evening. Okay. Or discussing it. Andy wants me to make sure that everybody knows that too. Okay. Um, and with that, we begin at item number one. Kathleen and Thomas Fleming and Turner Drive Property LLC uh, for a final subdivision. Mrs. Klauberg. Good evening, Melissa Klauberg, Ivy Barnum and O'Meara for the record. Um, <clears throat> Hello? It looks like it's on. Is it on? This is on and the light's on. The light's on. Is it not? Tom. My hero. It's on? How's that? Better? Sorry. Okay. Okay. I'll just lean into it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, again, Melissa Klauberg for the record, Ivy Barnum and O'Mara. Um, this application is made by Turner Drive LLC, the owners of Zero Turner Drive, and uh, two trusts that are owners of 21 Calhoun Drive. It actually, even though it's called a subdivision application, it's an application really to, to commemorate properly a lot split that was done in the 70s. There was never a map filed at that time. It just apparently wasn't done that way then. So, um, and then we'd also like to slightly revise the lot line dividing the two parcels. Uh, the two properties are known as Zero Turner Drive and 21 Calhoun Drive. were separated in 1978 when the Papalardos conveyed 21 Calhoun Drive, which contained almost two acres to Lester Gottlieb. The property was ultimately conveyed to Thomas and Catherine Flepping, Fleming in July 1990. The Flemings later conveyed 21 Calhoun to two resident trusts, which they are now trustees of. The Papalardos, um, when they conveyed in 78, retained title to zero Turner Drive, which contained a little over an acre, until they conveyed that property to some relatives, Gerald and Julie Papalardo, in 1986. And the Papalardos conveyed the property to some trusts and later to a corporation. And that corporation conveyed to Catherine Fleming in 1996. Um, she now owns it in the name of an LLC. The two properties have been separate in name since 1978, have separate tax account numbers, and are both in the RA1 zone. Um, the 21 Calhoun has a residence of 6,000 square feet, and that is still, will still be okay for FAR purposes when uh, the 4,000 square feet is given to zero Turner Drive. Uh, I jump ahead. So the application is twofold. One is to confirm that the two properties are in fact two properties as they have been since 1978. And the second goal is to adjust the property lines to allow more space on zero Turner Drive for a potential house and septic system. The proposal is to transfer 4,713 square feet from 21 Calhoun Drive to zero Turner Drive, leaving Calhoun Drive with 1.8 acres and zero Turner Drive with 1.159 acres. Uh, so I respectfully request that you grant this decision that it's not a subdivision and uh, approve the revision of the lot lines. Um, Mrs. Klauberg, a couple of questions that came up yesterday. The first one was uh, the pool house that's on site mm -hmm. on the, on the <coughs> property that is losing drive. area. Is, does that have a kitchen, a bedroom? Uh, is that laid out as a standalone house or is it only a pool house? 
I believe it's only a pool house. Would you, well, I think what, um, could we just condition, could we just request that the applicant submit verification of that? Because the concern is if you, if it is equivalent, as you know, to a full, t full residence, then you're creating a greater nonconformity because you need the, the double lot in order to have two houses on it. So as long as it isn't equivalent to okay, the, um, we have the, the property owner says here and she said that the, uh, there's no other amenities that they can't talk to us. We have to pretend Sorry. we don't see them. And uh, she said that it's only a uh, pool and uh, no okay. other amenities. Just the only thing. But if you would just submit that. The second thing is that um, there was an appeal, 8208, um, that was filed. And on that, um, there was a screening condition. And apparently, the ZEO doesn't, isn't sure if it's been met. Yeah. So we would also request that the applicant meet that condition. Okay. From what I understand, there's quite a bit of screening between the two parcels. But for some reason, the ZEO raised it. So again, if the applicant could just... Now, um, Katie, since this split was done, the original split was done prior to the two lot subdivision requirements in 2005, we don't do anything with it, right? We just treat it as two existing lots. Well, no, the, the finding would have to be that it was, that it was split back then mm -hmm. um, and but but there since there was no such thing per se but you said it was in in 1979 79 so that was during the time period where as long as it was creating legal size lots yeah created legal because, size lots yeah, because the yeah. subdivision during that time period was three or more right so if you you know if you and it was a two lot you, sub at the time right. so if you see this as one property then it certainly would need to come in for a subdivision well, it's been two properties on the tax record since 79, and it came out when they had the free, and they did it when they had the free split. So, so then there's we just confirm. Merger. So, so we would just, no, it's two different properties on the tax records right, at present. So, so you have to look at things like what are the, what's the ownership? Are they in separate ownership? And they are, um, as represented, right? What's the tax right? record history? What's the use of the property? Right. Um, so. So you have to look at all those things. In now, totality. at present, you have an accessory building on the second property, right? Just a uh, tennis court on the separate lot. So what does that do? So, the, but that's in a separate ownership than the one with the Correct. primary Two structure. Two separate ownerships. Okay. Right. So, so we can treat it as an existing as, separate property. Right, but it's clearly been used as one property. The subject's on that property in the tennis court, but the fact that it's in separate ownership. We can treat it as be already being two separate right, properties. Two separate. If, if that's the finding yeah. you want. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So those are the three things you did. Okay. Um, anybody else on the commission have questions? Okay. Mr. McGuire, could I have a motion? Mm. Uh, uh, I can always jump in. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Um, that's neither separate nor separate. Yes, we got a green sheet. Okay. We did because it says to request it. Did we finally get it? Yes, we got it. Okay. So you get the pool, the pool, the screening, mm -hmm. the pool has the screening, and that it's an existing tool. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in the for the application, uh, PLPZ 2018-00544 for final subdivision to confirm existing of two separate properties at 21 Calhoun Zero Turner Drive. Uh, motion to. It's neither a subdivision. No, neither a subdivision uh, nor a resubdivision. Uh, it was uh, test there was testimony that the pool house is just an indoor pool. It does not contain a kitchen or living facilities. Uh, the applicant will abide by the ZBA appeal 8208 and meet the condition of that appeal uh, to provide screening. Um, and I and that this has been an existing that this has been that this property is has been in two separate ownerships and has existed as two lots since 1979 and further um, that having found that this is neither a subdivision or a resubdivision uh, the Commission notes that th there will not be an easement required um, that that Wait, hold on a second. I think you do require the easement for the storm infrastructure per DPW. Does anybody remember where that is? 15. 
yeah. yeah, and I think they said regardless they wanted to have easements if you are relocating. Uh, any stormwater infrastructure yeah. located within the area of the proposed? It, it, okay, so, so that's the last condition. Conditions that you would have of to um, give an easement if you locate any stormwater infrastructure, and then finally we note that the health department has okayed you for the two septic systems. And with that, do I have a second? Second. Second from Peter Levy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. For the next application, number two, uh, Lucia and Tommaso La Roca at 74 Byram Terrace Drive. This is for a final site plan uh, for uh, set aside housing development as defined under Section 830G of the Connecticut General Statutes. Mr. Hegney. Good evening, Madam Chair. Um, you have a you have slides. <laughs> Well, you know, wow. uh, I, I got an email from uh, uh, your staff today uh, or earlier this week saying that uh, you guys were going high tech. I wanted to partake. It's a brave new world. New year. <laughs> Only if they'd like to see them. Okay. Uh, we're here representing the applicants, uh, Lucy and Tommaso LaRocca. Uh, they have uh, a building at the end of Byron Terrace Drive. Uh, it has three units. Uh, according to the zoning and building records, only two of the units have been uh, uh, approved. Uh, the Lil Rocas uh, acquired the property in 1997. Uh, they've been paying uh, taxes for three units. They believe that they had a three unit property. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, a complaint was filed with the zoning enforcement staff, uh, and we were unable to produce the paperwork uh, in order to verify uh, that third unit. Uh, we come before you to ask that that uh, unit be validated as an affordable housing unit under the state statutes. <coughs> um, well, so I do have slides here. Uh, we're not proposing any construction as part of this uh, application. Uh, so the, the survey will remain the same. Uh, Architect Tim Peck uh, was able to put together uh, floor plans for the three units. And on top of doing the floor plans, we asked him to do an evaluation of the existing uh, uh, building on how it met uh, the building code. Uh, uh, Mr. Peck uh, identified a number of uh, uh, changes uh, that are all minor in nature uh, to the separation walls, uh, the stairway doors, and egress windows. Uh, that could be made to uh, bring the building up to code. Uh, earlier uh, yesterday, uh, uh, HUD building official uh, Bill Maher uh, reviewed Tim's assessment uh, and agreed with it and uh, recommended that we include uh, uh, fire alarms and carbon monoxide detectors, which we would be happy to do as a condition of approval. Um, Mr. Hagney, um at present, it is the basement apartment that is not legal, but under the regulations, I believe that the affordable apartment has to be comparable in, to the other apartments in the other two or three bedroom units. There, there so are, are you of, going there are a number to of standards that you can look at when determining comparability. So, and, so and were you going to make one of the other apartments the affordable unit and have the basement be a market rate? Because we have not received an affordability plan from you, so we don't know. Uh, we've submitted a declaration of restrictions. Uh, what we have not submitted is a marketability plan. Uh, in our review of the, the state standards for what a marketability plan would have to uh, feature, it has to comply with the Department of Housing's uh, regulations. Uh, when we took a look at what uh, the town and uh, uh, Kay Duluka's staff put together uh, this summer to update uh, the uh, moderate income a marketability plan. Mm -hmm. We found that uh, the town's plan uh, more than adequately meets the state standards and the state regulations, and we would offer to file a plan that uh, reflects that. Well, if you want to go to 2010, you can't, because uh, this is in the R6, and we don't have R6. That's true. Um, but what the, uh, the marketability plan that the town has prepared uh, complies with the uh, 
uh, the state fair housing regulations, uh, section 8-37EE-4, or dash one through 400, specifically subsection four, uh, for a marketability. And so we would be able to take advantage of using what the town has put together and approved uh, for our project here. Following you, the town G, which is I'm sorry, every time I um, what, what I'm saying is we can repurpose that worked. Uh, Madam Chair, what I'm saying is we can repurpose the marketability plan that the town has prepared to show compliance with the state statute as well. And that because of what uh, the, the revamping or the, uh, uh, the revisions made to the town's document is that it now complies with, or maybe perhaps always had, complied with the Department of Housing standards so we can use the same marketability plan. Oh, you're not really answering my question about the bedrooms, are you? Well, what I would say is that uh, there are a number of ways of measuring comparability, and in addition to looking at bedroom count, they look at access to light and air. Uh, if you go and look at Katie, uh, the bedroom unit here, you'll see that the bedroom, all the rooms in this basement unit have access to the ground level, adequate air, and light. So uh, we're not dealing with a, a, a unit that is Mr. substantially Hagen? different. Yes. Do you have better? Do you have better photographs of the building, please? I do. It doesn't comply with the regulations. You can't do it. Uh, this is the exterior of the building. I, I know that uh, yesterday, when uh, uh, the, when the uh, the commission was uh, reviewing, uh, Mr. Hagen, yes. do you have a, have photographs of the, all sides of the building? Uh, not in my slides, but I, I do have the photographs uh, that you I can show me. Submit. You show me a floor plan that show, shows windows, but I'd like to see the windows on the building because um, the windows could be so much for being high tech. Yeah, the window. The windows could be. <laughs> We're getting there. The windows could be just a you know it could be basement window. When you say light and air, I'm thinking sure. it's a window. Or not and a sky and, window. and uh, we can provide photos that will show that. And uh, what you'd see is that perhaps. If you take a look at this side of the building here, this is the basement level. You can see separated from the rest of the building uh, that's not in brick. Uh, the window that is shown on the facade of the building is comparable uh, to the, the windows that you'll find on all sides of the building. So you'd be looking at something that does have uh, uh, windows that are, are similar in, in size and in shape. Uh, we'll have to be uh, replacing a few of them for egress purposes as outlined in uh, our architect's letter. What is the elevation of the basement? Is it at ground level or is it below ground level or not? Uh, the basement is not uh, below ground. It is, is at grade. It is at grade. And so you'll see, actually. So this could be an ADA unit. That's correct. To the, to the earlier point that um, uh, Madam Chair was raising about the comparability. So I, staff has spent considerable time with the Department of Housing in, in Hartford um, to discuss affordability in the town as a whole. And in that discussion, we did talk about Trumbull, Connecticut, that had a program 10, 15 years ago that was similar to what you're asking to do here, which is convert illegal units. And that was a very, very successful program, and they were able to add considerable housing stock, affordable housing stock, to their inventory. Having said that, I do think it would be appropriate to wait on this application until we can show these specific plans and get an affordability plan that's specific to 830G. Because I know I understand what you're saying, and we can give you a similar we can give you a similar model, but for the 830G. <laughs> you can, no, I understand. I, I, there is diff there is a lot of um, difference in them. I, I understand that the the town's plan is, is tailored to uh, 6110 and, and the things that the town is interested in providing to uh, obviously municipal staff. Uh, 
But uh, I, I do believe that uh, the town's plan would be something that would fit this situation. Okay, but Mr. They are Hegney, similar, but, and we can give you the one for the for the 830G. Mr. Hegney, um, I don't know about the rest of the commission, but I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of the affordable apartment being less desirable than the other apartments, because that's not the intent of either our 6110 regulation or of 830G. So if you believe that it is okay for it to have less bedrooms, I think it would still be worthwhile to have our own town council review this. We, we can certainly put okay, together so uh, we'd like to leave this open, I think. Does anybody else have comments on this? I, I know we just, have public comments. I would just wonder that state that maybe less bedrooms wouldn't make it less desirable okay but the I'm just to the law is that it has to be a comparable number of bedrooms as I remember it it, it is one of the standards that the, yeah. the, the law does look to and it's because they're trying to make them the same they're trying to make the affordable apartment equal um, anybody else have comments on uh, this? parking yes ZEO says you're short right. by 1.2. Uh, I guess through the narrative, there's two in the garage and four outside. We do, we do have an oversized driveway that we believe can fit four cars fairly easily. Okay. Um, I'm concerned about the garage, and you provided a picture if you can put that up. Yes. Looks like it's not very conducive to a parking actually specifically two cars inside mm. the other critical thing I'm thinking is that if you have two cars inside and then you have four cars outside in three units that way you have three different families jockeying cars around in the driveway to move things around we've talked about actually the stacked parking situation is other applications where in, for example, two units, they're stacked, each unit actually just moving their two cars. In this, we're actually moving around a lot more than that, and now it's winding up on the street. We know that Byram Terrace has got on-street parking issues. Actually, you can show another picture here of actually people parking on the street adjacent to the property. That's correct. Uh, on the left of this photo here, you have the end of the driveway, and this is the end of Byram Terrace Drive. I, to, to be fair, uh, Mr. Macri, I actually believe that works in our application's favor. Uh, I understand that there are concerns about congestion of street parking on Byram Terrace Drive, even though that is how the neighborhood uses their street. Uh, however, we are at the very end of the street. And you can see that if we don't park cars there, it creates a very dangerous condition. The other thing that I want to what, note uh, is that... What? What was that? Well... <laughs> Unless you really like orange signs uh, and you don't have parked cars there, uh, it's, a, it's a very dangerous end to uh, uh, Byram Terrace Drive there. I'm not following you, Boot, but that's okay. Keep going. Uh, but what I'd like to show is, is, is this photo here, which is the, the incline that you're coming down uh, Byram Terrace Drive to get to this property and 71 Byram Terrace Drive across the street. There's really no one else on the street that is coming down to this portion of the road in order to look for parking. Uh, it is uh, very isolated from the remainder of the street, and, and due to those conditions, uh, we would ask that the commission consider modifying their parking requirement in this instance. So the assumption of actually using the street because nobody's on it for the required parking on the property? Uh, we're open to, to other uh, thoughts on how to manage parking. Uh, I've discussed uh, uh, in imposing uh, uh, parking restrictions via the lease uh, with my clients. Um, uh, but we do believe that based on, on the available street parking on Byram Terrace Drive and the parking that we ha uh, can provide on site, uh, that we can uh, adequately provide parking for uh, whatever requirement uh, we need to meet. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Any comments from the public? Ma'am? Ma'am, please please come up here. We were having enough trouble hearing hearing folks that weren't up here. Uh, my name is Connie Buzabi. I live at 70 Byron Terrace Drive. Yes, ma'am. As far as it's t saying about traffic, it's like a zoo down here all the time. 
is a dead end street. There's a sign that says dead end. And there's traffic down there up and down all day, all day. So as far as I'm saying that there's not going to be enough, that there's a, it's an isolated street, it's not. Okay. You go up and down Byron Terrace Drive, you can't get two cars up and down it. Ms. Rosati, the, you're saying that the, the, the traffic comes down to... They turn around the because they don't know that's a side. dead end. There's a big, big sign that says dead end, but yet they still come down there, turn around. This parking is terrible down there. I mean, there's, we have cars parked in front of our house all the time. Going back there to parties and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's, um, it's gotten ridiculous over the years. Now, our concern is that there are small kids on the street, there's small kids in that house there, and they come flying down the street. Right? Especially the woman that lives at 62 Byron Terrace, I mean at 71. Okay. And she has two small kids of her own. I mean, it's, it's like a freeway sometimes. Yeah. It's, unfortunately, there's a lot of people all over the place who... Well, you know, we're opposed yeah. to it because it's been an illegal apartment for years. Okay. And nobody's ever done anything about it. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mrs. Rosati. Um, is there anyone else who wants to comment on this application? Um, so, Mr. Hegney, uh, we would like to leave this open. We'll be happy to do that and provide you with the additional information that you're looking for. Okay. Um, in terms of... Um, um, yeah, okay, so if you would give us the extension, if you can't, I'm sorry, Mrs. Rosati, please come back up. I think Mr. Hegney won't mind. I'm sorry. sorry. Um, I have one more comment about the apartment. Yeah, good. Um, Thank you. I've been in the apartment, and it's only suitable for one person. It's very yes. small. Yeah, that's what, it was a one bed, it's a very small apartment. And yeah, I saw the that. windows are very small. Yeah. This doesn't get a lot of light. So they would need to change the windows. If you're parking a, a car in the garage and you leave it running, mm -hmm. that person's going to smell the fumes. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Rosati. Uh, so, Mr. Hegney, we're going to need an extension from you. I'd be happy to provide that, Madam Chair. For um, whenever you think, um, I guess, Katie, you need to let them know by when they owe us the material on the marketability plan, but then in addition, uh, we've got to ask our council to review. Uh, well, it's, it's, I was more thinking of getting something from the Department of Housing Perfect. as opposed to our council. Perfect. That would so work even that, better. I mean, the, the applicant could obtain something from that. So we, we'd be happy to do that as well. Uh, we did review the, the housing regulations as part of this, so we'd, we'd be prepared to uh, satisfy those requirements. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Hengi, one more thing. Can you have your uh, architect provide staff the width of the garage door, please? Uh, we, we can certainly do that as well. Thank you. Mm, should we ask for a carbon monoxide test for the apartment? Uh, so, Mr. Hegney, is there no, the right kind of door? to go to the 2 5 meeting just because 122 is that okay? Thank you. I'd be happy to do that. No, no, but I'm asking is the door, is there a door yeah. into the garage that, yeah, yes, so. that's going to be part of the code compliance. Okay, all right. Okay, we're all done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, as mentioned earlier, we've postponed the, 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 the next application has been postponed, number three. Uh, we're now on number four, David and Alicia Collier at, uh, for a preliminary coastal subdivision at 370 Sound Beach Ave. And uh, this is coastal. And uh, Mr. Haslin, is that you representing this yes. application? Okay, thank you. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Chip Haslam from Johnson, Haslam, and Hogeman for the Colliers who are here tonight. Uh, yep, 
there you are. Great. Um, this is my first time doing a PowerPoint presentation, too, so I gave you a handout in case we kind of get bogged down. Because of how well our mics were working. Well, that too, but uh, I thought it might be easier if I have difficulties if you just look at your packet, and it, it should match up with the PowerPoint presentation, and hopefully it will. Uh, this is a oversized lot um, in Old Greenwich, right on Sound Beach Road, the corner of Lincoln and Sound Beach um, Avenue, rather. It's 22,575 square feet in the R12 zone. And uh, the proposal is to subdivide it into two lots, one of which would be 14,171 square feet. That would be the one fronting on Sound Beach. And the other would be fronting on Lincoln. It would be 8,403 square feet. Um, obviously, because the second lot is undersized for the zone, it would require a variance. But before I can go to the ZBA, uh, to seek a variance, I am required under the regulations to come before you folks under preliminary subdivision, so that's why we're here tonight. And we're hoping that we can get the green light to at least make our case to the ZBA as to uh, the subdivision of this property. Um, I have, as a housekeeping matter, It was raised, uh, the fact was raised that the, uh, in the caption it shows that the scale is, is 1 to uh, 10, when in fact it's 1 to 20, and the original plan that I have up on the board and up on the screen is actually the printer slightly got the scale wrong, but it does in fact have the, the 80 feet of frontage required. I have substitute plans attached to that board. I'll pass up tonight to staff members to make sure you have that in the file uh, for the preliminary aspect of this application, but it was just a, an error. Uh, on the printer's part and the engineer's part. Um, the history of this property, let's see if I can figure this out. <clears throat> it's such that uh, this is part of a subdivision laid out in 1922 um, prior to uh, zoning. And uh, as you can see in, your, in the handout, which is probably easier than seeing on the screen, uh, part of the lot is the James B. Riley lot shown on map 830 in your packet fronting on Sound Beach Avenue, the largest lot that you can see there. And uh, Mr. Riley subsequently in 1922 acquired lots one and two behind it as well. So he had that large lot and the, uh, the extra two lots behind it, which now comprise the entirety of the Collier's property, the 22,575 square feet. Much of the uh, subdivision has been developed. Most of it's been developed over the years. Uh, in 1969, the um, uh, subdivision area was all upzoned from R7 to R12. The James B. Riley lot was already uh, designated as R12, so that didn't change at all. However, the, the cow was already more or less out of the barn when horse. it was upzoned because of the development of, of horse. Uh, horse. Yeah. You'd prefer horse. English is a first language for you. <laughs> I was an English major. I should have that too. <laughs> um, and you can see that on the exhibits. Uh, that is also in your packet, GIS of the neighborhood, uh, showing how Lincoln Avenue has been uh, developed over the years. In particular, um, let's say the median lot size on uh, Lincoln Avenue uh, is 6,970 square feet, whereas we're proposing for the Lincoln Avenue lot 8,403 square feet. That would mean that uh, the maximum allowable median uh, on Lincoln Avenue would be uh, 2,196 square feet uh, uh, for, a, for a structure. And for the most part, many of these lots are non-conforming as to size on Lincoln Avenue and also as to the size of the structures. Uh, I would uh, submit to the commission that at 8,000 square feet, 8,400 square feet, um, we would be allowed to build a structure uh, which would be commensurate with the rest of the neighborhood at uh, 2,196 uh, square feet on the new lot. So I know that the uh, commission had discussed whether or not an HO would be applicable to this property rather than coming in for a subdivision approval. And I have had discussions with the Colliers about this possibility. Um, they love their house. It has an interesting history. It dates in the early uh, 1900s. And uh, many years ago, I think it was kind of noticeable on Sound Beach Avenue because it had the black awnings in the front as you were driving down towards the beach. You could see it on the corner of Lincoln. 
They've owned it since 2011, and they're at a kind of a crossroads of what do they do with this, with this property and with this house. Um, it's, they could build, under the regulations, a 7,100 square foot home on the lot. Um, clearly, this neighborhood, certainly on the Lincoln Avenue side, doesn't lend itself towards a house of that size. It's just not in keeping with the neighborhood whatsoever. Um, similarly, it uh, really does not, is not in keeping with a lot of the houses on Sound Beach as well. There are some larger lots, not larger than this lot, but uh, similarly uh, larger than prescribed lots on Sound Beach Avenue, but most of them are around the size of 4,000 square feet or so. We gave you a matrix that's in your packet comparing properties on Lincoln Avenue and also on Sound Beach, and uh, I would refer you to that to, to look and see what the, the surrounding neighborhood really is supporting currently and what it, we think it could support by way of development of this lot. So with that in mind, and also I should mention too that the Colliers are not really that interested in building out a house of that size. It doesn't serve their purposes to have own a house that, that gigantic. Um, and um, they don't really want to sell it to a, a developer or somebody else that might do that and build a bigger house on, on, the, uh, on the lot. Um, they're not against the idea of putting a restriction on the main house uh, to protect I'm not it. Sure, you're uh, you're sort of not answering the HO question though, because what we were thinking is, you could build a second house on the property that you are intending to subdivide out. Exactly, I'm getting to that point. Oh, okay, now. so right. if the Colliers want to build a house on their present lot. Are, I believe that's within their right and not something that we can react to and say, oh my, no, because the regulations allow them to do that. But so what we were wondering is would they build a house without doing a subdivision that creates a non conformity? Right. And I, so there's three, I think you're right, there's three things they could possibly Jeez, do. Thanks. They could, they could actually. <laughs> sell the property or develop it themselves to 7,100 square feet, pretty much as of right. They could uh, use an HO and okay. uh, basically have two principal structures on the property, mm -hmm. or they could subdivide it as they're proposing to you. And as far as the HO is concerned, it is certainly an option, as I said, I've discussed it with them, and they're not necessarily against the concept of having an HO easement over their house or the restrictions for that. The problem for them, and I can understand it, it's different than when you have, I have had several other applications like this, where you have an existing structure, a cottage or a garage or a pool house or something, which is easily lends itself to being renovated, restored, improved or whatever and made a secondary dwelling. In this situation, they would have to undertake to build themselves a new house on the property, and then that house would be either a rental or they would have to create a condominium in order to um, basically make sure that they could recoup so, what they put into the property. I was actually thinking about this today. Katie, wouldn't they be able to give someone else the right to build on the property? Well, yes, but the problem is it's, as Mr. Housen's pointing out, it's, it's one zoning lot. Right. Currently. So you would so have to condominiumize it somehow. Yeah, right, and a two-person condo is not a, not ideal, because you're always stuck in a 50-50. That's so a you don't have the tiebreaker. Exactly. So that's a problem that realtors and attorneys generally tell their clients: do not buy into a two-unit subdivision. I mean, two-unit condominium because of the fact that you always have 50-50 splits on the votes, and it can become there, quite problematic. There was a subdivision on Sound Beach way on the other end, though, I think. Um, I think it was the Burke subdivision, if I remember correctly, that did subdivide the property. Um, I forget the specifics, but let's say they could have done four lots or something, and they, they went down to three, if I remember correctly. I mean, it wasn't an easy road because it was in the beginning. I think it may have even been a lawsuit. I, like I said, I don't remember the specifics. But end result was there was a subdivision that so with with a historic overlay so they were right. able to create the lot um, and you know in exchange for preserving in perpetuity the primary structure that's from the 80s I think which is something I you and I yeah, discussed Katie's the possibility of creating a okay. hybrid and I would discuss that more with the Colliers if that was acceptable but I wasn't sure that that would be something that would pass muster with this Commission um, I think mr. Haslin that that understanding guess selling is a not a great idea from applicants point of view the subdivision as proposed seems I understand your argument but at the same time you're kind of creating a non-conformancy 
and from actually what you've given us and what you just explained is that whole that whole lot was the largest and actually two separate lots historically since 1922 so it actually everything kind of leads back to that HO situation and it, it seems from our discussions that it seems like a win-win you get a you get the second house you preserve the existing home right. which everybody appreciates because it faces the street as part of South Beach Avenue. Um, I think it's actually just a technical issue now of understanding actually the the historic subdivision, lack of a better way to say that. Um, and if that actually as a as a technicality can be figured out and that language put together, that might be your best recourse. So if I understand you, Mr. Macker, you're saying that there's a possibility what we could do is do some sort of a uh, HO overlay or easement or whatever, and but still be allowed to subdivide the property into two lots. Right, because I think your your problem is that, like you just said, it was that 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 uh, two two uh, entity condominium, which is right. not ideal. Maybe there's another way of going about it, and actually maybe a little exploration into that to say, can it be a, a two lot subdivision under an HO, and you're getting yes the second house, but you're actually preserving the existing house. Um, so everybody kind of work, you know. Everybody comes up uh, okay on this. We're not creating a nonconformity. We're saving a house, and the applicant gets this, the second house. Katie, would, if we put an HO over the property, could it be subdivided without going to the board of appeals because it's in an HO, and we have some wiggle room there? Yeah, I don't think it would need to go to the. I don't think it would need to go to the Board of Appeals. Uh, that you for would have some control under under the, the HO. right. So you could put an HO over it, and then apply, reapply for the subdivision, or do it at the same but time. It would, it would be a, a result. You know, you'd have to do the HO mm -hmm. portion of it. Yes. Right. But then it would take their application from the Board of Appeals out of play. Right. And I think also it would probably be preferable, too, from the neighbor's perspective. We have support, most of the neighbors, but there's a couple, um, Mrs. Lawrence right to the rear, and Mr. Kaplan, I think, who's number five, I believe, Lincoln, or seven. Um, I think it's important for people to know that under the HO, if we were to do it as one lot, we get the 15% bonus on the FAR, plus we get some relief from the side yard right. setback, which would affect Mrs. Lawrence. So we could actually build up to... Um, 8,178 square feet of total FAR under the HO. If we did it with some sort of a subdivision with an overlay, that would restrict the size of the house on the new lot, which I think is to the benefit of the neighbors, and I would think they would want that. So I think there's a win-win. Another win winning plan. So we could yeah. create a win-win. What, what, what are other thoughts here? What do you guys think? Just if I could, do, just for the right, you have, all you have is the right to ask for that, just That's so we're clear. Sorry. You, don't, you don't get that as of right, right. The, the bonus for the FAR. They could right. uh, it has request to, go through a to process. build that. Yes. We get a little touchy sometimes. <laughs> you know, I think there's uh, two streetscapes here, Sound Beach and Lincoln. Um, and to preserve the Sound Beach streetscape, I think would be very important, which it sounds like that's what you're proposing. Well, I think it does that, Mr. Hartman, too, because this particular lot is long and narrow, so it's not, you're not splitting <coughs> the lot on Sound Beach, that you're kind of basically, you know, uh, squeezing a, another house in on the Sound Beach side. You wouldn't see it from Sound Beach. It doesn't impact Sound Beach. Um, it doesn't change the uh, the look of Sound Beach because it'll all be in Lincoln. So I, I think it's effective. Um, and I think it's a logical solution to a, a tricky little problem. And I think actually this, this is an interesting tool going forward, the, like the historic subdivision or HO subdivision. Um, actually, it's quite intriguing because I think actually our thoughts on trying to preserve older homes, giving that bonus or that second unit and how to go about that tricky condominium issue. Right. You know, actually like, trying to figure that out actually is, a, is uh, very interesting to me. And I think actually, if we could make it work, um, using it again and again, that kind of thing is great. But I think this is a perfect uh, candidate for that and to see how it'll work because I think it's actually, it's the intent of an HO, saving the building. Right. You know, but providing uh, you know the applicant uh, something in for saving the building, right? So, um, and then one other thing is the lack of open space. If you were going to do a subdivision, and 
Um, just to put our cards on the table, as we've been working on the POCD, one of the things we've been talking about is that in this type of subdivision, whether when you require the open space, quality, deep-rooted planting, an easement that provides quality, deep root planting um, could be considered whether we would allow that eventually as a type of open space for the denser neighborhoods because it serves the purpose of the open space, which is the decarbonization by the trees and the filtration, the groundwater recharge, all that. So. Um, just as food for thought, as you're looking at how to put this together, if your client would consider an easement of open space on the bigger lot where there's the room for it, especially since they're not planning on mm -hmm. expanding, um, that gets around the two biggest obstacles that, that I had, at least, in seeing this. Now, no promises, but... So if... Um Colliers seem to be they're nodding, so I think the yeah. idea is certainly something that they're willing to entertain if we have some more time to talk about it. Um, so with regard to next steps, there may be people in the room that want to speak to this matter. But, yeah, I uh, think there are. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, back in 2001, there was a, a lot split that was requested for subdivision, and the commission granted it at the time, but it, it went to ZBA and, and the board denied it. Uh, in uh, basically because they claimed that it was going to impact the appearance of Sound Beach Avenue, which I don't think is necessarily the case. But there were 35 people that objected to that application back at that time. Um, now you have more support. Now I've got support for it. And I think that there's, a, um, there's been some turnover in the neighborhood, and I think people recognize that as far as reasonable development is concerned, this might be better than, not everybody, but better than but, uh, for the rest of the neighborhood too. I think that when people object, and stop me, you guys, if you disagree, but what people will, might object to is, changing that losing historic structures we're going to protect a historic structure right. second changing streetscape um, to mr hardman's point you're keeping the streetscape on sound beach and hopefully what gets created on lincoln ends up being consistent with lincoln basically because of the size of the lot right it, it, and but that ends up being consistent so you get um mr hardman made the appointment at the uh, point at the briefing yesterday that Sound Beach and Lincoln are two totally different streetscapes, mm -hmm. and that it made sense to him that it be that they were they retain internal consistency, consistency with each with within that street. So you would be accomplishing that. So I think we could, if you noodle on that, we could create a win-win. Okay, Get I us some open space. Figure out how to protect the historic structure. Would you want me to, uh, before I come back to you folks then, would you want me to go to the HDC and have them opine? I think that uh, makes sense. I think um, that. Actually, actually, it's required. before you go off to them, right. I think it's actually working out that language of the, the of the HO subdivision. Reviewing it with staff. That's the first step. If it doesn't work, well, right. why, why go off to HDC? But talk sure. to staff about it. Well, that's what it. I mean. That's yeah. what I mean. And just a big lead in that direction. It wasn't Burke. It was Brock. I was close. Brock, okay. Yeah. And it was um, uh, number 733. And I'm just looking at it now. So obviously the fact pattern is slightly different, but the concept is comparable. Okay. So I think we need to sit down and review that and see how something that is, you know, how something has occurred in the past and how it could be um, something similar could occur under the existing regulations, as Mr. Macri points out, before you go to the HDC. All right, so that's fine. That, that makes sense. That. And I'll, I'll email it to you. I have it here. So if then you can just uh, there may be some people from the public, as I said, who want to speak, but uh, um, we'll come back. Okay, thank you. But before the public speaks, does anybody on the commission have any more comments? Okay. Um, does anybody from the public want to speak on this? Yes, ma'am. Hillary Lawrence, 6 Lincoln Avenue. Hello, Mrs. Lawrence. Hi, how are you? Thank you for letting us do this. I, I have a point that my You have to take the mic with you, and you can get someone to help you plonk it out if. On this chart, there are discrepancies in what's listed as lot number one and lot number two. 
And if you look back, I, I can refer you to the Moore's application. But on the Moore's application in 2001, there were two strips right here that are about 15 feet wide, and those are not building lots. They're, there's not enough room. They're just two little strips. I can, I can give you the okay. number to refer in the, in the... They may be some kind of easement? I don't know. I'm, okay, I'm just, well, I'm, we'll get Mr. Haslund to answer that. Okay, so that's the first thing is that there's um, two, that when the application for the subdivision went in, there were two strips on either side? No, they were, um, the Moore's application was 1559, and if you look at those uh, microfilms in the office, they, they have parcel A, parcel B, Strip one and strip two. Okay. So there, there's a historical back reference. And I apologize. I'm sort of doing this on the fly because um, a lot of this is news to me tonight. Um, obviously, I'm opposed. The Colliers have been good neighbors, and they're included in many of the Lincoln Avenue neighborhood social activities. The children and many friends enjoy the open lot. We have enjoyed watching the children play and grow up and it would have devastated my mother to know we were back in front of B and Z again. We were represented in 2001 by Jane Hogeman, and she represented my mother, Jane Lawrence, and James and Maury Benton at 5 St. Clair Avenue. Maury has since passed and James has moved away. Ruth Lockwood at 366 Sound Beach Avenue supported us but was in declining health. The whole area started being developed in the early 1900s. And since the single deed description of the property in 1920, it's been a single parcel for decades. In 1922, when Mr. Riley purchased, he also purchased that lot and one and two to add to the property to create the parcel as it exists today. There's no record of previous subdivision or re-subdivision. In 1926, I have a copy of the map, the earlier map showing the same configuration with the large parcels fronting Sound Beach Avenue. Going forward from 1933, the deed history shows that this lot has been in its current configuration since 1933. In 1938, the parcels were zoned as A or B. The R12 designation was not used yet with the A residents requiring more land. 370 is parcel A. In the 1939 map at the appeals meeting, Mr. Colson stated 1939 zoning clearly indicates that at that point, the town wanted to have Sound Beach and Shore Road at a higher level than the properties off on the side streets. In 1947, the property was upgraded to the R12 zone. 1961 in September, the McKenzie's, Malcolm and Dorothy, applied for subdivision and withdrew the application one month before the Moore's purchase. The Moore's purchased, as I said, in 1961 in October. In 1964, Gifford and Ruth Reed purchased 26 Lincoln Avenue as two lots, which I will note that was also a variance issued, but it's the R7 zone. They gave me permission to read the letter that they wrote in 2001 tonight. And this re referenced the Moors. We're writing to express our opposition to the Moors' request to divide their property at the corner of Lincoln and Sound Beach into two building lots. The Moors have owned this property since 1961 and have had the opportunity to divide their property into two lots when this was zoned R7. We bought our property in 1964, divided it into two lots, as we in the public have been made aware that there was serious consideration being given to changing the zoning in our area to R12. We have, by dividing the property, been paying taxes on two building lots. The Moors have been paying taxes on one building lot and presumably greatly reduced taxes on the land in excess of a building lot for this zone. 
We are asking the Board of Appeals to recognize that one, the Moors could have and should have divided the property as we did prior to the zoning change as there was ample time to do so. Two, it is unfair of us, sorry, it is unfair to us who willingly pay taxes on two lots for over 36 years to protect the property as separate building lots. That was 2001. In 1974 and 1973, the Moors filed applications for building permits for it adding to their property, showing their entire property. So they acknowledged that this has been the full lot. It has been developed as one parcel. It has never been kept as two separate parcels. The property has been taxed as one parcel all the way down the line. The tax assessor, I understand, gives a tax break for excess acreage. If the Moors had checkerboarded, they would be paying a higher tax amount. And what that means is they have chosen to keep it as one parcel. They enjoyed a tax break and the use of a larger parcel. Mr. Weisbrot at the time on P&Z asked if it was a hardship because of the rezoning from R7 to R12 and that other variances had been allowed by P&Z. Jane Hogeman answered, this property was never in the R7 zone. In 2001, there was a petition of 38 neighbors, several letters and speakers. Appeal 8642 was denied on June 20th, 2001. They stated that the Moors did not articulate hardship as the SBA neighborhood has not seen similar development. We all need to know and understand the history of this property and that it has always been one parcel on Sound Beach Avenue. Previous applications to subdivide have been withdrawn and denied. Please deny this application for subdivision. Mrs. Lawrence. Um, Miss. Miss, sorry, my apologies. Okay. What would, um, of, of the concerns that you have, what is the, the, the most important objection that you would have to this? I just don't want to look out at another house right out. I mean, they can be five feet from my property line, I okay. understand. There are serious water issues. Um, and I don't, I don't know how those can be solved. But I have pictures of three inches of water throughout my whole backyard and the Collier's yard. Okay. I, I understand we've had a very wet summer, but. Yeah, but still. Okay. So you're. Those problems have existed for decades. Yeah. Okay. So the, the one is just the additional development and the second concern is the the effect, the possible effect on water and flooding. And any development here would come to us anyway because it's a coastal and it's a flood zone. And I don't know if it's also a flood zone, but it's a coastal, this is a coastal application. Yeah. So it would come before us anyway um, to verify the flooding. But okay, so the key concern for you is one, the development, and the other one, uh, having seen the flooding. Plus the, <coughs> excuse me, plus the neighborhood has seen the two houses behind me have been demolished and re reconstructed. And, you know, the noise level and the dust and, and the distraction is just, it's horrible. Yeah, I know. And this would be closer, closer to me. Can you, um, you had noted the appeal number of that Zoning Board of Appeals. Can you just state that one again, please? Because um, it, from 2001? Yes, I think, it was, I, I'll give I think you said it was 1659, but I 1559 oh, 1559. Okay. I just yeah, because I just want to be able to give the commission the, the fact pattern of that denial versus yes. what they're proposing now. Yeah, and the reasons given. So we'll get all the records out on that and all the transcripts that are available and we'll read through what everybody said. Okay. Up to Katie because it goes into the record. Thank you, Ms. Lawrence. Thank you. I should just say Ms. Yep. <coughs> and Mr. Housing. 
Is there anyone else from the public? I don't see anyone else getting up, so I'm guessing not. Um, just a couple of thoughts. First of all, it's it's uh, there's no flood zone on this property, but it is in the coastal overlay, so it's it would. And then I wasn't sure. No, but it, it it's would, just camp. Yeah, but it would have to come back to you for camp. For camp. Approval. And obviously, we would have to deal with some of the drainage issues, um, even if we were to do this as a HO in the traditional sense. We'd and have I, to do that. And one too. of the things long range is for your clients to consider the the concern. Yes, and, and actually, um, they've reached out to Ms. Lawrence uh, indicating that there's things that they would be happy to work with her on and trying to resolve some of her issues, and we, we hope to have that dialogue continue, if possible, if she's open to that idea, um, to, to try to make sure that uh, the impact on her is minimized, um, if we possibly can. So. so I think you just leave it open then at this point, if you could, to give me yeah. an opportunity to speak to staff, and I may have um, to give you a continuance. I'm not sure that you're going to run into a bit of a problem unless you move quickly because this is a must decide by mid February. Well, the other choice we could have is um, could con consider withdrawing it and you working out the up, issues. Well, you may end up doing that anyway. Well, let's see what happens. Why don't you right. meet with Katie? Well, see where you go with it. We just, I mean, what is, you've already received, a, there has been a denial on this property. Yes. From the Zoning Board of Appeals. So could you just explain what the plan is if you were going to go forward? I mean, you're presenting a different plan. Is this a different plan than what was presented previously? It is, but I mean, it's not, you can't say that it's incredibly different than what was there beforehand. Um, Jane represented the neighbors and did a dogged job like Jane always does um, way back in 2001. And uh, I think she got the board to focus more on Sound Beach than on uh, um, Lincoln. And uh, she they missed the point that this is the orientation of the front part of the lot within the rear part of the lot Sound Beach Avenue versus Ford. So I think I'd like to be able to make that argument again. Tony D'Angelo represented the applicant at the time, and I don't think he was ready for that argument to come forward. Um, but also, uh, as I said, I think the neighborhood's changed too. And uh, the, I think the thinking within the neighborhood about what best serves uh, that community and how you would have a house with one focus on Sound Beach, frontage on that, and one on Lincoln, which would be of a reasonable size and would protect the, the main house, too, if we go down that route. Um, I think there's support there for this where there wasn't before, and I think I'd like to make that argument to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, so those are principally two issues. Okay, so now I'm confused because I thought the deal was we were going to go the, we were going to look at this no. HO. Right, it's just if, if, we, were, if we had to go to the ZBA. Okay, so you're still going to go to ZBA? Not necessarily. We're going to. Can't go until he gets a preliminary. For yeah, and that's not. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and I think I should meet with you, Katie, because you're indicating that we might be able to avoid the ZBA portion of that, stick that's with the, the commission on, a, on this right. hybrid. Potentially. Potentially. So I think we got to make a, you got to make a, a good plan. Right. So, um, Madam Chair, I, I suggest to just leave it open for the moment. Give me an opportunity to speak yeah. with staff, and if I need to give you continuance or withdraw it, okay. I need to talk to my clients as well. Um, and see what's okay. the right path to take. Okay. Anybody else have comments for Mr. Haslund? Okay. And with Thank that, you very much. Thank you, Mr. Haslund. Okay. So with that, um, we go to the next application. And, excuse me. If I may. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Mr. Haslund, would you object to Ms. Lawrence speaking again after no. you've closed? Okay. No. Sorry. Th there's a rule close. that. Understand. After we, I, once I just, he's done speaking, I just would have preferred to have talked about this before the application was filled, filed at all. Well, I, I, hopefully, I find this whole process. Hopefully, people will reach out to you now and dialogue with they you. They have, now. but I didn't want to talk to them until we're not, we had. We're nowhere near doing anything with it right now, so you've got that. time for dialogue. I understand that. Okay. But I, I think the dialogue should have happened before okay. we ended up here. Okay. Thank hopefully, you. it'll get better. Thank you, Ms. Lawrence. Um, now we're going to go to the um, fifth application. Uh, Mr. Fox is recused from this application because of a conflict of interest. And um, seated for Mr. Fox tonight is Goss. Goss. no Victoria is seated is seated for Richard. So who's seated for Dennis. Dennis. Mr. Yeski is seated for Mr. Fox. Victoria is seated for Richard. You're seated for Fox. Okay. Yesterday we didn't have that, so. Yesterday, Victoria was the seated applicant, the whole meet, the seated alternate for the whole meeting, because she's seated for Richard because we have the vacancy. 
Now we have a second vacancy, which is Mr. Fox, and you are seated for him. You good? Now, good. Mr. Now, if Patrick changes that after we went through all that explanation, uh, I will. I will quadruple check. Okay, Madam Chair, and we'll so confirm. So, first question, um, Mr. Cohen, while you're setting up, um, would you have any objection to us opening the public hearing at this time, and opening both applications at the same time? No. Great. Second thing, so we will now begin the public hearing. Second thing, Mr. Cohen, I believe you're aware that at the briefing session yesterday, there were two main lines of conversation. Uh, the first one was for the commission to gain an understanding of the broad overall strategy, what the game plan is long term for Greenwich Academy. And then the second one was, as regards this specific application, how you see it as being consistent with the HO that's in place and dates back to 1979. So those are the two th big issues that got raised yesterday. And if you don't mind, it would be great to go right to those. That good with you? Do you want to uh, deal with both applications together uh, at the same Do time? Do you object to that? No. No? You're good? So we'll, we'll open. Let me just uh, point out, though, that the uh, first. Pardon me? He, he wants to know who you are, in I, case oh. you're an imposter. <laughs> yes. I'm Bruce Cohen, and I represent Greenwich Academy. And then you were going to say something, sir. Uh, first of all, I, I, I was hoping to get a special dispensation on the uh, t high technology just based upon the lack of technical ability. <laughs> so I'll, oh, okay. I'll do the best I can. Again, you're not supposed to, there's not supposed to be age discrimination in and, this building. And I'll get one of my grandchildren to teach me how to. So, um, Mr. Cohen, as long as you, um, we're happy to give you the dispensation for being technically challenged. Um, I believe the previous chair would have stood up and given you a hurrah. Cause, um, and so, so if you have no objection and you want to open both, um, where do you guys want to, if it's, I think the bigger thing is to talk, to, to talk about the, where the academy's going overall. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm well, sorry. I think they, well, we had talked about it. I'm sure staff had, had uh, informed you. We were very interested in um, these, the academy's master plan for their properties. Um, rather than focus on, okay, what's going on here, one of the biggest questions we had in our discussions was, why is this here and what happens up the street? Uh, one of our members actually asked and requested if uh, administration could come and inform us of the master plan, what's happening today, what's happening in you know a couple of years. Because, uh, you know, I, if we can focus on this little piece and then, you know, we know there's there's applications that are pending for the other part, for the main campus. And we want to see how it all fits together um, as a specific thing for the whole neighborhood. Uh, I, we have a map that was given to us by staff that actually shows the properties and they're kind of all over the place. So I'd rather not look at one little thing just yet. I want to know the big picture. And if there is administration that can give us the big picture, if there is a master plan, and talk about that first. And there is. The, I'm so uh, sorry, school. Mr. Cohen, to interrupt. I do just need to get on the record that, as Mr. McElroy alluded, there, there is a pending application on the other campus. So it's very important that, that it's very clear to everybody that any discussion of the campus, at the, the, the main campus, is for informational purposes only. The commission will not be making any commentary whatsoever I'm on a good plan, bad plan. That's not of interest to the commission at this point. It's just for informational purposes only as it fits into the current site plan. And just to make a little pitch for the town, the new town hall, the new town website, the applications that have been filed and are pending before PNZ are all listed on it. So the commission is aware, although it has not seen the application for the main campus, the, com the commission is aware that it has been filed. Yes, it was filed. Uh so a little just, over a month ago, and in yeah. fact, uh, it's progressed to a point where we're appearing before ARC tomorrow night. Yep. Okay. So that's moving ahead. But in response to your overall question, let me, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll approach it exactly as you suggest, Ms. Albin. Uh, and with me tonight is uh, 
is Molly King, who is the head of the school, to talk about exactly what you had in, in mind to give you an overall picture. Uh, but to address what uh, Mr. McRae had to say, this, I, I take it, is the map that you were talking about, uh, Mr. McRae, that everybody has received. So maybe to begin, I could kind of go through that to show you all of the properties, and you can put uh, uh, Molly's uh, presentation in, into context in terms of the various properties. So if you would, uh, if everybody has one of these, uh, it was extremely helpful. Um, the, the large area to the north, of course, is the main campus. Uh, that entire campus is uh, uh, used for educational purposes. There is um, uh, one building that's kind of slotted down toward the middle that is purely residential in the sense that it's never been uh, 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 granted a special exception. So it was purchased as a residence. It remains a residence. It's Molly King's uh, home, uh, but it, as you can see, it's connected to the main campus. To the northeast, uh, that blob of green is the Riverview, Ridgeview campus, which is the home of the uh, uh, school's uh, kindergarten and uh, pre-kindergarten kids. And you're familiar with that because not uh, very long ago you granted uh, site plan and uh, special permit approval uh, f to allow those uh, buildings to be renovated and reconstructed. Actually, I think that that took place before uh, this commission changed uh, section 94, uh, I think it's A, Five, uh, the provision that uh, used to allow the Zoning Board of Appeals to grant special exceptions to allow uh, nonprofit uh, uh, educational institutions in a residential zone. So that was not before you for that purpose, but it certainly was for, uh, for site plan purposes. And I do believe that uh, the uh, ZBA granted special exception at that time. So uh, wandering further south, uh, the next l area of dark green is the property that's before you tonight that we'll uh, discuss, 96 and 100 uh, Maple Avenue. And then to the southwest of that, there are a number of individual parcels, all um, used for uh, staff and faculty housing, but uh, not for educational purposes in the sense that uh, uh, they were purchased and used as uh, houses and and that's where the uh, families uh, of the school live. Further south, uh, just uh, the last piece is another single family house on Mar Avenue that the school purchased for uh, residential purposes. Uh, so, uh, as I say, Molly uh, King is with us tonight. Uh, she, Mr. Cohen, yeah, just real yeah. quick. Um, the what appears to be a, another lot just there at the corner of uh, Patterson and North Maple. I think that's contiguous to the main campus, but Patterson and North. It's right there at the corner. Uh, that. That's to Patterson. Uh, there's a house on uh, that property. Uh, that is proposed to be demolished as a part of the lower school uh, uh, project, which has been filed but hasn't yet been heard by this commission. It is a part of the campus. Thank you. Uh, and then, again, before Molly uh, takes over and, and gives you the idea of the master plan, let me uh, show you a little bit about the relationship between the campus and the property that is before you tonight. So this is an aerial photograph that's upside down. Yeah. Uh, that uh, shows Maple Avenue, 96 and 100 uh, to the left. This is the parcel that we're talking about uh, tonight. And the main campus, I uh, as you've seen it uh, in the smaller map, it is outlined in white over here. So the relationship is, obviously, uh, the school is interested in, in, in purchase and, and did 
purchase uh, 96 and 100 because of its, uh, the fact that it was so close to the main campus uh, within walking distance. So that's the relationship. And then uh, a little further on, Brunswick, part of the Brunswick campus is immediately to the north of 96 and 100, and it continues to Mar Avenue on this uh, side. So uh, I think the best thing I can do right now is to ask uh, Molly King if she would uh, give you an overall idea of the campus. This is a, uh, a plan showing the uh, existing uh, main campus. And she will briefly tell you how, uh, how the school proposes to modify that. Good evening. Uh, nice to see all of you. I'm um, Molly King, as, as Bruce said, and I'm um, in my 15th year uh, as head of school at Greenwich Academy. Uh, this is actually the first major construction project um, in my tenure, um, of which the 96 Maple um, project is a part of the overall plan. So uh, to address your question, uh, just the overview um, of, of what we are undertaking, uh, we did a full one-year master campus plan um, undertaken by Society associates um, and engaging our entire community during the 2017-2018 school year um, in order to really see um, what our needs are to provide the best experience for our students and our teachers um, in the 21st century. Um, our current lower school uh, was built in the early 70s. Um, it's an aging building uh, that doesn't actually smell very good um, at this point. Um, most important though, teaching and learning have evolved significantly since that time, um, focused on more open, flexible spaces that support collaborative and small group learning options. Um, so this has been reinforced in our studies of other schools, both public and private, um, and as um, Bruce Cohen mentioned, we've submitted plans and um, will appear before ARC for this main campus project uh, tomorrow night. Um, the current Cowan Center, uh, located currently on our, our main campus, um, because of our needs to provide ideal teaching and learning spaces for grades one through 12, and that's who's on our main campus. The Ridgeview campus, as he said, is our um, pre-K and K. Uh, as part of our master campus plan then, we really reviewed any other functions that were not directly connected to grades one through 12. That was going to be our primary focus. And Cowan Center is one of those functions that is not related to grades one through 12. Um, as background for you, the Cowan Center was established in the early 1990s as a, a faculty benefit for GA and Brunswick employees. Uh, it's a subsidized daycare and preschool program offered to faculty and staff. It provides a nurturing environment in close proximity, uh, of course, to GA employees. Um, the program has historically had 60 children, um, and as space um, has allowed on an annual basis, um, if it has, we've permitted GA and Brunswick affiliated families, and that's referenced in the application, uh, to attend the program. Um, and this assists GA in financially supporting the Cowan Center. Um, and an affiliated family, uh, just to be clear, would be a family that has a child currently enrolled at GAA or Brunswick. Um, the current Cowan Center uh, in, in what is known as the Carriage House is outdated. Um, it's not an ideal space uh, for this program. Relocating uh, the Cowan Center uh, provides an opportunity to both better address the learning needs for early childhood development, um, and it allows us to leverage current FAR on our main campus, and that was something that really came out of this master campus plan, was the need to do that. 
Um, some of the challenges of the current Cowan Center building um, include inconsistent temperatures between rooms. Given the age of the building, it makes it uncomfortable for many children and teachers. Bathrooms that are not easily accessible to our children who need them. Um, a steep set of stairs uh, that have to be navigated by toddlers, um, which is suboptimal, um, obviously. No common area for meeting and to facilitate group learning and enrichment experiences. And finally, the location um, in the midst of the lower school parking lot that is obviously serving the main campus needs um, is a safety concern for us. Um, it is important for you all um, to know, um, and we've certainly shared this with the neighbors, um, we're not proposing to increase enrollment at Greenwich Academy. That is exclusively in deference to our neighbors. Demand to attend GA um, is high, but we understand the sensitivities in play for our largely residential neighborhood. Um, in addition, we have no plans to increase the enrollment of the Cowan Center, which is currently um, 60 babies and children ages eight weeks um, to four. Um, 96 Maple, uh, this house had been on the market for some time. It is in need of extensive renovation um, given its state of disrepair. Um, the previous owners approached GA uh, to potentially purchase the property uh, as it provided us with a unique opportunity um, for GA to address several key priorities uh, that had emerged both from our strategic plan and master campus plan, the school moved forward um, with acquiring the property. Um, one of the key priorities, and Bruce noted this, is to provide walkable housing opportunities for our staff as well. Um, and in fact, this year we started offering an incentive program to encourage um, our faculty who live in the neighborhood, um, especially in our housing, to be walking to campus. Um, what does 96 Maple offer us as a site for the Cowan Center? Um, I share this uh, directly from our Cowan Center director um, and longtime um, Greenwich resident, Amy Antorno, uh, who is present tonight. She says, the welcoming front entry at 96 Maple offers a warm home-like experience for our youngest learners. Inside spaces are ideally suited to our small class size and large bright windows provide a happy atmosphere and engage children with the natural environment outside. The close proximity to GA's campus will be comforting to the teachers and the children. The youngest children will appreciate rides uh, in their strollers through the tree-lined sidewalks, while the preschool children will be able to access more of the local community through walking field trips, allowing a true understanding of the world around them. The intentionality of the curriculum encourages children to explore and investigate their wonders and interests. How better to learn than to be submerged in an environment rich with community resources, the church, the inn, medical professionals, a grocery store, to name a few of the places that we're excited about. The current Cowan Center is smaller and not as well equipped to address the 21st century priorities for early childhood education. The new site at 96 Maple not only allows us a pristine new space with interior renovations designed for their well-being, safety, and learning, but it also provides much needed housing for our teachers, two units on the upper two floors. Concerning housing and teachers uh, and extending from our strategic plan completed in 2016, and master campus plan completed in 2018, Greenwich Academy identified the need for additional housing. Our teachers are committed to their students and they work well beyond the scope of the school day. For older students, they coach athletics, they direct and teach a variety of artistic endeavors, necessitating that they live um, in nearby uh, housing if they're going to be able to fully support the GA experience. GA is actually behind um, some of our benchmark schools in the area, like our brother's school, Brunswick, and Greenwich Country Day, in terms of providing housing. And it's important to us, and more broadly, many in town, to provide affordable housing for teachers. Having teachers live in Greenwich, whether public or private, is a plus. They're engaged citizens and volunteers and committed to the welfare of our community by the very nature of their work with our children. 
Recruiting and retaining top teachers is extremely competitive for schools. And for many, the cost of living in Greenwich is an immediate eliminator from consideration. Providing housing as well as proximate subsidized daycare is a game changer in GA's ability to recruit and retain top teachers. 96 and the bordering 100 Maple help us address these fundamental priorities. Most compelling uh, is to hear a brief story that illustrates these priorities. Um, and so in that vein, I'd like to introduce to you um, faculty member Maureen Corbo. Thank you. Maureen? Um, I'm Maureen Corbo, and I teach sixth grade English at Greenwich Academy. I have two children at the Cowan Center, my daughter Millie, who is two years old, and my son Matthew, who is two months old. Tonight, I want to tell you about my experience with the Cowan Center and what it means to me. And as a mother who just yesterday went back to work smoothly and happily after a 10-week maternity leave, I can tell you that it means just about everything to me. Twelve years ago, when I started at GA, I quickly realized that the Cowan Center was something extraordinary. I loved to see the red buggy strollers around campus and would stop to say hello to friends' smiling babies. GA faculty would talk about Cowan with awestruck voices. How do they do it? Cowan Center is the stuff of legends. We've all cracked up hearing our PE teacher, Jamie, tell the story of bringing her fussy daughter to Cowan and saying, I know you guys are miracle workers, but I'm pretty sure this kid is broken. By the end of the week, the Cowan teachers had Jamie's difficult, impossible baby on a predictable sleep schedule. When we gather a few times a year for all school faculty meetings, it's always acknowledged that we're able to be together because of the amazing Cowan Center staff and that they're caring for all of our children. And I would hear the cheers and watch people stand and clap at the mere mention of this magical place. It seemed like this Cowan Center was more than daycare. Growing up, I always thought I would stay at home with my kids like my mom did, but I started to think that my kids would be missing out if they didn't get to experience a Cowan education. And that was a good thing, because in my time in Greenwich, I had fallen in love not only with teaching, but also with a local business owner, John Corbo, who was born and raised in Greenwich, and I could see a real future here. Now that we have two children at Cowan Center, I understand all of those standing ovations, and I appreciate GA's commitment to providing childcare and quality preschool education for its faculty on a much deeper, more personal level. I drop my kids off with people I care about, whom I trust, admire, and respect as the childcare experts that they are. I worked at GA for nearly 10 years before having my daughter. I had eaten lunch with Liliana, the infant room teacher, nearly every day for the past decade. So when I dropped Millie off for the first time, it wasn't to a new place or to strangers. I put her in the arms of my friend. Liliana has my kids tonight. <laughs> and into the arms of Penny, the ultimate baby whisperer. My husband swears she must have extra limbs. She can sue the baby in one arm while rocking a bouncy seat with her toe, all while reading a story to the toddler on her lap. Yesterday, I gave my son a kiss, handed him to Penny, and watched his face light up, instantly entranced by Penny's spell. An hour later, Penny sent me an email from Matthew saying, hi, mom and dad. As you can see, I'm having a great first day of school with a picture of him smiling just as happy as can be. My friends filled with nostalgia said they couldn't wait for me to pick him up and smell that Penny smell. That Penny smell is technically Elizabeth Taylor Diamond's perfume, but it's also a warm memory of love knowing that your baby has been held, cuddled, and cherished. I can't imagine that there's another daycare center on earth where parents crave and miss its smell. Cowan Center has taught Millie more than I could ever have hoped for, to say please and thank you in English, Spanish, and sign language, to put on her winter coat all by herself, to cough into her elbow, to wait her turn, to comfort a friend, to share. Working on the sharing. The learning never stops at Cowan. Each day we receive a daily email with pictures from the day, often with an explanation of the learning standards being met. I always forward the email to both sets of grandparents. It's a highlight of everyone's day, and it always astounds them to see the variety of activities, the care and creativity that's put into each day's project. From manipulatives to letter sounds, colors, counting, the focus is on play, and the kids just know it as fun, but the learning is deep, and they leave Cowan ready for pre-K and kindergarten. 
and Cowan's small class size means that the teachers truly know each child. They know my daughter's strengths and needs, what progress she's made, and her goals for the future. Cowan Center has taught me, too. It's helped me to be a better parent, to understand my daughter in new ways. Honestly, all I need to do when at home is remember to not mess up the Cowan routine. My kids are close by and safe. If something happens, if they're not feeling 100%, I know that I can get to them quickly. Cowan Center brings a comfort, a sense of security that all working mothers should have. This proximity also means that I can nurse during the day. When my students go to gym class, I walk over to Cowan and breastfeed my baby. I don't have to go a full day without seeing him. I drop my son off and think I just have to make it to 945. I'm endlessly grateful to GA for all of the support and flexibility they offer to breastfeeding mothers. And Cowan Center's proximity to my classroom means that I can see my kids as much as possible. Once my workday ends, my babies are in my arms 10 minutes later. Cowan Center has enriched the heart of GA, pulling an already tight-knit community closer. I know my colleagues' kids' favorite colors, toys, what makes them laugh and cry. In the hallways, a fellow Cowan parent will ask how my daughter is feeling, knowing that she had an ear infection last week. In the cafeteria, a Cowan teacher will tap my shoulder and say, oh, Millie loved music class this morning. If you've ever left your child in someone else's care, you know what these little moments, little glimpses into her day mean to you. I love that my children have an entire community looking out for them. Cowan Center means that I can do what I love without worry. Teaching is in my bones, something I feel called to do. My classroom is my happy place, and because of Cowan, there is no conflict. I never had to choose between my career and my family. When I'm working, I can be 100% present. So while it's hard to say goodbye to my kids in the morning, I'm always so happy to be able to do what I love to do without guilt, without feeling like my kids are missing out. I know my kids are loved and cared for, and they are forming friendships and learning skills that they wouldn't get from me. And as Cowan follows the school year schedule, I'm able to be home with them on our breaks and for the entire summer. Cowan Center means that I am a better employee, colleague, teacher, and mother. It's a second home and a huge blessing for my whole family. Thank you. This is, excuse me, this is a public hearing. We cannot have anyone calling Mr. out. Mr. Cohen. This is, this is on the record, so we can only have me. one speaker Mr. At a Cohen, time. if you would proceed. Yes, I will. Uh, uh, finish up what you heard from um, Molly. Uh, the uh, the change that's being proposed uh, on the main campus, which she described as that came out of the master uh, plan uh, that she talked about, has to do with replacing the existing uh, lower school, which is now at the end of the middle school, and moving it over here. Uh, essentially, that's the change. It also involves changes to the Cowan Center as it now exists, which was the old carriage house, and there's a wing that would be removed, uh, landscaping, some parking improvement, but from the school's educational point of view, it's, it's really the uh, lower school uh, reconstruction. Yes, Mr. Tesskesi. Um We've seen this before where the space on this campus, is there an FAR issue on this campus? There is not. So they could build more than what they have right now? Or there is, and let me just con finish with, uh, uh, with the rest of the master plan. There is a, uh, an additional plan to put a visual arts center of about 6,000 feet in the center part of the campus with, because there will be excess uh, FAR at the end of this project, but there is no immediate plan for that. It is part of the master plan that uh, Sasaki prepared. So that b basically is kind of the big picture as what as to what uh, the school has planned down the road, how this property pertains and relates to the Cowan Center property at, on Maple Avenue and the other parcels uh, owned by uh, owned by the school. Um, uh, there were a couple of other issues that were raised, I understand, from... Um, just, just one second. Um, Mr. Hardman, you had some questions yesterday about the... F yeah, yeah, I think the <coughs> entry level question is just part of which was answered already. There's no foreseen increase in student population. 
Uh, could you comment on faculty and support staff? Um, uh, well, I, I'd, I'd have to turn to uh, Molly, but I don't believe there's any plan change. Okay. She's and, shaking and, her head now. And second, as you've uh, sort of undertaken you know, very careful planning, uh, what is there a transportation plan, for lack of a better word, that would improve uh, the flow of traffic in a neighborhood? Uh, I, you, I, you. I, I heard some mention of uh, incentives for people to walk, uh, but I'm just not familiar with what, if any, shuttling's done between the different addresses here on the map you provided us and what can be done, you know, not even, not just now, but going forward uh, to further reduce traffic. Fine. Uh, one of the benefits, of course, of having nearby faculty housing is the ability to, to be able to walk to school, as you can see. But th the school has had an initiative for quite a while. Molly, maybe you could talk about that in terms of uh, ride sharing, buses, and that sort of thing. Uh, and I believe that um, the traffic consultant, are we hearing from John later on? Yeah, so certainly any technical questions you have um, for the traffic consultant. But yes, for um, the last, um, certainly the last uh, four to five years, um, we have been uh, putting more emphasis on uh, reducing the number of cars that, that come onto campus. Uh, so just again for context, um, for student drivers, only uh, seniors are, are allowed to drive on campus. Typically there's about 80 80 seniors um, in a grade um, and then uh, for employees we've been um, encouraging um, ride share options um, and walking um, about four to five years ago um, we implemented um, shuttles both to the Greenwich train station and Stanford train station um, those are our hour vans that pick up students um, and faculty um, commuting from Upper Fairfield County or from um, the city um, we uh, have a transportation coordinator um, who uh, works with um, all of the towns uh, as well as with the town of Greenwich um, and we've been um, promoting ridership uh, on the town buses. Um, in addition, uh, in order to uh, again reduce cars and, in and increase ridership, um, we piloted a year ago um, at our expense um, an additional bus service um, from Old Greenwich, and we've been piloting that in other areas um, simply because um, for the younger students, um, if it's uh, multi-school drop-offs, it can sometimes be longer. So we thought that piloting um, and, and taking on at our own expense um, our own buses would help, and, that, and that's been very successful. So we're now in our second year. So um, we promote this both as part of our overall environmental stewardship uh, and sustainability efforts that are really embedded into the curriculum and something that that we take seriously and also of course in the interest of being a good neighbor knowing that it's a sensitivity um, because it's not just Greenwich Academy a number of other schools um, are in close proximity so one one question that we discussed yesterday was uh, with the movement of the Cowan Center here you could argue that there's net no change in traffic related to GA unless there's something that was going to be done at the current Cowan Center, which would be redeveloped and bring you know, either more students, or faculty, or admins. And that's not the case, it seems. Correct. Thank you. And Ms. King, may I ask a couple Molly? questions, too? Oh, sorry. How you doing? Hi, fine. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned teachers. And mm -hmm. you know we're struggling in this town with housing. Yes. Uh, at all levels mm -hmm. how many teachers actually live on the campus or live on all the properties that you uh, own so right now um, it's about 40 percent right of our teachers are housed and um, I would say that the largest concentration of them are on Northfield uh, Street um, so Northfield um, division um, and uh, then, um, as Bruce Cohen mentioned, Juan Mar, so there are some single residences. About how many teachers would that be 
Um, uh, so how many units? How many teachers? Just ballpark. I don't need. Yeah. We, yeah. We, yeah, 40 to 50 teachers. Out of how many total in the school? Uh, out of a total of uh, about 180. Yeah. And that's increased. Uh, you've been able to provide Well, that's more increased housing. in terms of number of units. And remember, some of these are duplex uh, homes and all. Um, but I, I do recall when I got to GA in 2004, we had 17 units. That included um, the Heads House. And um, now I think we're in the high 30s. Um, and, and so, as I said, it's about 40%. Um, and, and I'm very conscious, you know, just in terms of other schools in town, our brother's school in Greenwich Country Day are above well, that. Somewhere down the line in the other application, mm -hmm. it would be helpful if you and the other schools have information on housing uh, as it relates to workforce. We, we call workforce, your teachers are workforce housing. Yep. Yeah. It's a huge problem in the town. Huge. You're providing some solution, as the other schools are. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you have more information, that would be very helpful. I'm happy to do that. I mean, it's a huge priority. And I think you all can imagine when you're trying to recruit teachers nationally, this goes for any of the schools. Uh, as soon as they hear Greenwich, Connecticut, it just, it, most people, most teachers, would dismiss that out of hand as something that's not affordable. And you now we have folks that are commuting from New Haven and I mean, quite a distance. And if you're going to be there for the full experience of the kids, um, that's, a, that's a tough thing to do. So it's a high priority. Um, you mentioned the other, the, the, expand, the new revision to the master plans. Basically what I got out of it was you're, you're not increasing the students, you're not increasing the faculty, you're not increasing the staff. You're making some buildings larger because that's the new way, the, the open, flexible, more common area. Correct. Uh, similar to a lot of companies out there at this point in time. Correct. But the FAR is not an issue on the on the campus, the main campus here. Do you, do you have a term for this? Camp main or just main campus? Main campus. Main campus. Yes. So not an issue as far as we can see. And again, I know we have to go through this in the application. I'm just no. I, I mean, it's it was part of the entire master campus plan as we looked at it, and so um, we are being judicious uh, in how we think about every bit of space. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, one of the things that came out of it as we were looking at okay, h how do we build a, a lower school? that is um, optimal for 2019 and going forward um, and the need for those flexible open spaces well then we had to look at okay as we're considering the whole of main campus uh, we obviously want to prioritize grades 1 through 12 who reside there uh, Ms. King um, what happens to the Cowan Center after as part of the master plan is it is it going to be used for what uh, sure. Uh, it uh, for um, for facilities, uh, which is actually what it was used for before Cowan Center was there. So we will retain the carriage house um, carriage house look. Um, and prior to the 1990s, when it opened, uh, it w was facilities, their offices, um, and then we'll have a, an apartment um, above for the director of facilities, which is really important for just the supervision. Okay. Of the As part of the master plan, was it? considered actually to try to keep the daycare center on the site close to the close to the faculty as opposed to down the street um, cons everything was considered I mean it was ab it was comprehensive but as we looked at the priorities as I've stated them to you um, that this is because okay. it seemed it seemed from testimony we just had that it actually that adjacency that convenience is actually very important it's 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 helpful um, no doubt but as you'll um, here further down the line as we get into the main campus um, proposal moving facilities back to that so that we can repurpose that site for things related to the educational function mm -hmm. uh, so that'll be part of it but all of those things were considered um, and um, you know at times you're having to prioritize mm -hmm. for sure you, you actually don't have faculty housing on the main campus do you and so as part of the main campus, currently we have um, the facilities uh, director living on campus, uh, the head living on campus, and the, uh, and the associate head, so uh, who's at 296. Yeah, so there's two or three. Most of them are on Northfield. Correct. 
I actually see another one too, which um, I assume it's housing at the end of Mar Avenue, almost on the Post Road. Yes, number one Mar Ave, okay. uh, which was a, um, a, a. So, other than the three that you mentioned, most of the faculty housing is over on Northfield, on Mar, uh, and might be in the new Cowan Center uh, on be the one that you're proposing at this Correct. point. Correct. And then 100 um, Maple. 100, right. Uh, behind it, yeah. Behind it, right. And then on Division Street, um, there are. Uh, there's a duplex. Yeah, I just wanted to correct it because sure. where the Cowan Center is now, mm -hmm. there's virtually no faculty housing. There's one small apartment now. Yes. I stand. Yeah. Most of it is off camp, off the correct. main campus. Correct. Correct. Of one or two units, I forget on on the field on Ridge Ridgeview over here. So as um, part of the new um, uh, pre-K building, there's an apartment on the top. Of that, that that was approved last year when you came forward and that will uh, that's Ridgeview and that's Ridgeview yes we remember that one yeah we, we, we've actually seen that one yeah yeah um, uh, well there's now a roof on it which is good okay we we might be back at some point on the data uh, because we're struggling happy. with housing markets and grant I'm, I'm well aware happy to help on that any way we can it's a huge priority yeah, mr. Cohen I've got a quick question Currently, with the structures that exist on the main campus, um, is there an FAR issue right now, today? No. You have excess FAR on the site? Yes. Okay. Um, by removing the buildings that are a part of the master plan, that gives you just more for the reconfiguration for the educational uses? Yes, it, it allows that much more FAR. But, okay. but the, I mean, the goal is to teach the same number of students with the same yes, number of teachers. Yes, I understand that. Um, that excess F FAR following through the, the full master plan for the Arts Center, I think it was you were talking Visual about? Visual Arts Center, yeah. Will that maximize or exceed FAR? Yeah, pretty close. Pretty close. There'll still be excess. But, you know, the whole issue of FAR, I represent uh, some schools. And the schools are all driven by FAR. They, they live and die by FAR. And, uh, and this planning process, which was months in, in determining what priorities were and making decisions about, you know, should this be here or should that be there? Or what do we get out of this? Uh, FAR was always the, the big issue in front of everybody. Yeah, I think what, what, what I'm getting at is that if there is excess, F, excess, excess FAR, barring the issues of actually concentrating and focusing on, on the 1 through 12 grades, it could be possible that the Cowan Center could actually stay on site somehow could be if, possible. without that focus. It could be possible. Kindergarten site. We would, we would fail to achieve several of the things that Molly uh, King addressed to you, but yeah. you know, we wouldn't get the additional uh, four units of housing, for example. Okay. So, um, is, unless anyone has any more questions, I'd like to go back to where we started, uh, Ms. Elbin, and that is your briefing session. Uh, there were a number of issues that were raised. I hope some of them have been uh, addressed, uh, but I would like to talk about a couple of other things that if were- you, Would you mind starting with the HO question, because that's the one that's burning in my mind. Well, tell me the, what your question is. Um, if, when I go back and I look, when we looked at the material given to us, the HO approval in 1979 and subsequent um, decision around it, it seems pretty clear that the intent of the commission was for 96 Maple to be residential and to limit broadening the uses of 96 Maple. In fact, there was one accessory use at, the, at one point, and a second one was requested, and that was denied. Uh, so what I'm struggling with is, to me, this proposal is not consistent, as I see it, with that original HO approval and the record that exists. To respond to that, let me just say that um Section 6-94A5 recently amended uh, 
permits as a permitted use, a nonprofit educational use in a residential zone, and it used to be, as I told you before, with the uh, approval, of, uh, special exception approval by the Board of Appeals. Now this uh, commission has taken that authority to itself, and so it's, with, it, it's on the basis of a special permit for which we've applied. So the issue really is whether or not the special a permit standards have been adequately addressed. And I don't have to tell you what they are because you live with them every day. Uh, we think they have been, and we think that there are many reasons, good reasons, for the conversion, in effect, from purely residential with a professional office, by the way, which was also approved by the commission at that time, to the, the use that we're proposing right now. Um, and, and one of the important issues that I, I think is, uh, I, from my point of view, uh, the most important is to consider is what the POCD says about it. The POCD makes a, a, a big point about the value of education and educational institutions to the town. There's no question about it. And I know you're dealing with this issue with the, with the revision to the, or the new POCD. But in, in Chapter 6 on page 54, the POCD states as follows. Greenwich is fortunate to have many educational op options with private schools providing opportunities for almost 5,000 children, many of whom would be added to the, the overall enrollment in the public schools of these if these facilities were not available in Greenwich. Most of these private schools have expanded their facilities and enrollments over the past 10 years which indicates demand and need for private education in Greenwich. Now, I'm not sure what the current look is going to be of this issue, but I certainly believe that the, the, the zoning regulations is that they now stand, which permit educational uses in residential zone, will not be changed, should not be changed, because of the importance of the schools of Greenwich to, to the town. Uh, so, in answer to your first question, which is the intention of the, uh, in the HO, th it is true that in granting the special exception, sorry, special permit, at the time the HO was enacted in 1979, the Commission permitted what the HO permits. We're not going back to seek any additional incentives from the a HO zone. We put the HO zone aside. We acknowledge the fact that this building must be protected as the, as the commission uh, required and as, as the HDC requires. We've appeared before the HDC. They've uh, approved the plans that we have for the building. They have one. They had one small suggestion about reorienting a, a, an exterior staircase, which has been done. But essentially, they've approved all of the restoration work that the school has undertaken to do to make this building uh, usable for the proposed use. Uh, I would also point out that in, in doing so, since, since we're on the subject of, of the HO, that when the HDC considered the HO in 1979, and in recommending the, the, the granting of the HO to this commission, uh, the the uh, Historic District Commission noted, and I quote from their letter to this commission, dated August 18, 1979, in arriving at its decision to recommend approval, the commission has taken into consideration the fact that applicant's building is not surrounded by one family housing, but by a school which was then the Greenwich Academy and is now Brunswick, a boarding house, which is now the uh, hotel called the Stanton House, and a club, the women's club. And those, those uh, buildings and uses uh, and others continue to exist in the neighborhood. This is another aerial photograph of Maple Avenue starting from uh, East Putnam and heading north to the school. The, the site that we're talking about, 96 and 100, is shown in white outline. The school 
main campus is here at the corner of uh, Perry Ridge and North Maple. Starting from the south, this is the first congregational church. It's not just a church, but under approval by the ZBA, uh, the church func uh, operates at a uh, daycare op uh, uh, center for ki 85 kids right now at, th at the location north of the church itself. To the north of that are other facilities that the uh, church uh, uses for various church activities and, and rentals. Uh, to the north of that is the Stanton House. Stanton House is a 20-room hotel with a, a, a pool uh, in the front yard. North of that is, the, is our parcel, and north of that is uh, Brunswick. Brunswick continues over all the way to uh, uh, Mar Avenue, and you've seen that in the, in the uh, plan that your staff prepared. On the other side of the street, we've got two medical buildings, uh, a four-unit uh, condominium, and the women's club with a fairly large uh, parking lot in back. So the area that we're talking about is not purely residential, and in fact, it was specifically noted as such in 1979. It hasn't changed anything anyway. If anything, it's gotten somewhat uh, more institutional. So if I may, Mr. Cohen, just one small point of clarification. Uh, you said that the uh, the professional use had been approved at the time that the HO was approved. That's um, actually not what is shown on the September 11th decision that I'm looking at. Um, it says it is indicated that the proposed use is to family. If a residential professional is contemplated, adequate parking must be provided. But in any event, um, I'm not asking, um, I, I, the, just again for clarification, we have the same issues with the POCD. We are clear that top quality education is a huge draw for Greenwich, that it is what gives us the reputation we have. But at the same time as we're working on this POCD, we are cognizant that those top quality facilities have to integrate as well as possible within existing, if they are in a residential neighborhood, to integrate a, in a better way, and how do we change the regulations to do that? All that being said, Mr. Cohen, I don't feel that you really address my concern. My question is not what the HDC said, but what has happened, what happened as the PNZ looked at this matter, and that the PNZ ruled it as a residential use and saw this HO as being residential, and that you are proposing to change the character of the historic overlay that was approved 40 years ago. 40? 40, 50 years. 79 to now? 40. Yeah. 40, exactly 40, yeah. 40. Character years. Character or intent? An intent that really what the surrounding neighborhood the, you go back to the decision, what created the HO, what is that HO? That HO was meant to be residential. That was how it was decided, and the commission lays the record for that. To me, you are changing that intent of that commission, and as I read what happened in subsequent years, there seems to have been an effort to preserve the residential. When they denied the request for the accessory elderly unit, and it looks like the owner went right ahead and added an apartment even though it was denied. Again, it was to preserve the essential low-density residential use. You, you change it significantly by having this daycare because it becomes an institutional use. And so that's what I'm struggling with, and I, I frankly... Let, let me see if I can help a little bit. Mm, yes. This commission in 1979 in granting the special permit really had no choice because the applicant was asking exactly for what the commission granted, two residential units, plus, as, as you note later on, a professional, uh, a residential pres professional office was added. In other words, it wasn't a condition that this commission placed on the special permit. It was an approval of an application. You had no choice under the HO regulations. Today, we're coming to you with a different application. We're coming to you for another permitted use in the residential zone under 94A5. We are asking that it be changed, and 
and we're putting it to you whether or not you believe that our, the standards of special permit approval have been met. I'm going to introduce shortly, Oops. let me finish, I'm going to introduce shortly John Canning to talk about traffic and parking because I know that's a significant issue in your consideration as to the standards. But let me, let me point out right now what the changes are in terms of whether or not there's a significant residential uh, uh, component to this in, in appearance. This is a, a, a plan which I've marked up showing the existing two parcels. I guess this relates to these, uh, the subdivision portion of our application. Uh, this is 100 to the north and 96 to the south. I've colored in the existing buildings in red, or, or outlined them, and I've colored in the existing blacktop driveway and parking areas in yellow. So that's what exists right now. Mr. Cohn, before we move on, how many units are in the, in the front building right now? No, uh, there's right, actually got to be occupied, but well, I, there's four kitchens. There are probably two, and, and judging from Ms. Sullivan says there may be a third there's illegal four, unit, but I don't believe they're occupied. Your letter, Mr. Cohen, if I could quote it, says there are four kitchens and 11 bedrooms at the present time, which would indicate that at some point there were four units, some of them being illegal, but it was approved the, for two. That will be changed to now, two legal units. Since we've interrupted you, Yes. Again, I come back to the the application for the elderly apartment in 1989. When the commission refers back to the accessory uses that are permitted in residential zones, but says, but is looking at this HO and says that it's affirming the intent of the, of the accessory uses, but they're looking to protect the low density and low impact characteristic of a single family zone while permitting complementary but limited accessory uses. To me, that again speaks to they're looking to protect the residential character of this property. Second, when you add that playground that we haven't even started to discuss to the rear building, to me, you are converting that property into an institutional use because you're putting an institutional use on it. So again, what enables you to take a residential property and make it and give an institutional use to it when, as I understand that that property is restricted to being residential, and I think we can't address that because it's deed restricted. I can, I can re address but that. Coming back to the HO, I'm just, I just went down that little segue there but coming back to the ho i'm st i still see this as a push over 40 years of keeping the residential and not this application but it would be so simple in my mind if you kept this residential and just made it four legal units how do we do that well you can do that under the ho if you merge the properties how do Maybe we am i incorrect how do we do how do we merge a non-HO into an HO and take advantage of the HO regulations on the non-HO? You make a new zone. You make the whole thing HO. You make. We the don't whole qualify on on 100. It's not over. Uh, it's it's not pre 1940. It's, it's got the historic building on the property. Once you've merged the property, Katie, stop me if no, I'm wrong. You could you could just keep the one in the back, the single family, and do the three in the front. Yeah. Using the new reg. I I don't can't do three in the front. I can only do two no, based you upon your special three. permit. You can Believe me, you, you'd be making a big mistake the if you did that. The planning director is telling you you can do three, Mr. Cohen. and I, I would accept, let, would let suggest you listen to what she has to say at least. Right or wrong? Katie, please. I'm just saying the regulation that was changed recently changed the multiplier. So you'd have to, so just if you kept it separate from the one in the back, so the one in the back would just be a single family home. And if you wanted to use it for the school purposes, you would have to convert it into, into this, you know, the school use, just like you've done with the other properties. Well, we, we can discuss that later. I, I'm still here trying to, to get the Cowan Center into this building. And let me just go back. And to, I'm still here saying, geez, I think this should be a residential use. Yeah, but you've got to let me make my presentation, don't yes, you? Yes, okay. Yes, I do. I thought I was doing a decent job of that. Uh, I only I, interrupted I respectfully you after, disagree. Only after Mr. McGuire broke in. Uh, I, I'm getting back to your residential area. Mm -hmm. the just to repeat, the residential area almost next door to us 
is includes a 20 room hotel with a swimming pool in the front yard. The residential area includes a school that's much larger than anything we're talking about at the Cowan Center. That, that's the Brunswick School. The, the residential area includes right across the street the Women's Club, a very active organization. It also includes, it also includes 85 kids coming in and out of the first, uh, the second congregational uh, daycare operation. So, when you say that uh, uh, you, you, the the commission has a feeling against uh, changing a residential area, no, I'm not really, speaking for the commission. You're when you when you I'm say you for these commissions, not this commission. Just to be clear, that's why I read out to you the the HDC recommendation letter in which they recommended to to this commission in 1979 that this was an appropriate non-residential area for the HO to be uh, situated. Um, in any event, uh, this is going to be in, in your eye as the eye of the beholder, but uh, I, I suggest to you that you'd be overlooking the clear evidence that this is at least a semi-institutional neighborhood as it was when the HO was first imposed in 1979. Uh, May I reply to you now? Of course. I don't think that the character of the neighborhood is the issue at hand. The issue at hand is that this was approved as a residential use when the HO was approved, this specific property. And I don't see the argument for changing it. I believe the intent was to make this residential. That's what you have to give me a different fact set on. And I'm open, I'm open to hear it. I know I'm pushing back, but I'm open to hear why you think that we should not respect that original HO? I'm, I'm asking you to respect that original HO by taking a look at what the HDC said in 1979. The HDC about is the neighborhood. not the Planning and Zoning Commission, sir. Pardon me? The HDC is not the Planning and Zoning Commission. Anyway, go ahead. I th just We're done. Okay, you sure? Yes. Um, I, I've got one question, <clears throat> please. So we understand that there's a deed restriction on the rear property. Yeah, thank you for And I'm not sure. That. But to begin with, as uh, Ms. Well, let me, let me just to point out. Yeah, let, let me finish this for a second. Um, I'm not sure the commission should sort of approve something that flies in the face of a deed restriction, even though that's not a planning and zoning matter, but just as a matter of conservation of you know, our resources, Fair is that enough. the right thing to do? There is a deed restriction, and the deed restriction, uh, all of the four lots that you see here were at one time a single lot owned by the person that owned uh, 96. And when she divided up the property, she placed deed restrictions on this property and on this property for residential use only. That deed restriction is enforceable only by the owner of 96, not by any other property owner. In other words, it's, it's the owner now, the Greenwich Country Day, uh, Greenwich Academy, of this parcel that has the right to enforce that restriction. So in effect, it, it's ineffective. But I would also point out that matters of title are not before the commission. Uh, but you're not wasting your time, Mr. Hardman. Uh, in any event, I was getting into what the plan is bef uh, before I introduced John Canning to talk about traffic. The plan is this. The plan is to take these two lots, put them together, change the configuration of the two driveways that exist right now into a single driveway with additional parking on the north side of the 100 Maple Avenue property and with uh, no change whatsoever to the two buildings except to restore them and rehabilitate them, which, which they need. This property will be made a single family house. This property will house the Cowan Center kids and two apartments. Uh, the school has had many, many meetings with its neighbors. Uh, we understand their concerns very well. We've 
modified their plans over a period of time. The plan that's before you tonight is this plan, and it shows uh, a couple of significant changes. Originally, there were two play areas for the school, one in, uh, on, on this side, one on this side, I guess to the south side of the, of the uh, uh, building, the other to the uh, west side. Uh, it, because of the concern of the property owner, Mr. Bloom, that owns this parcel of having it, this play area so close, it was moved to the area immediately adjacent to the Brunswick Fields. So now the only play area that's, that's uh, on this plan is for the littlest children, uh, and that's immediately next to the building. Uh, initially, this, the turnaround was closer to uh, uh, 100 Maple, again, the, 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 uh, Mr. Bloom was concerned about that and the activity that that might uh, raise. That was moved 25 feet to the east and 10 feet to the north. Additional planning has been put in uh, and, and the uh, idea of the residential units of three have been reduced to two there by reducing somewhat the parking in blacktop area. So uh, I wanted you to be clear with the uh, fact that the school has been very mindful of the concerns of its neighbors. It's met with its neighbors a number of times. It's changed its plans over uh, the months to accommodate their concerns. And uh, the plan that we have before you tonight accomplishes a lot for the school, as you heard from, Ms. M uh, from Molly. Uh, but it also provides for four new housing units uh, for teachers in walking distance from the school, S uh, sufficient parking, no impact. Is it three units in a house? It, it originally was for. Just want to make sure. Three. Thank okay. You. Mr. Mackey, you're right. Um, one of the big issues, of course, is uh, uh, parking and traffic, and particularly how neighborhood is going to be impacted by that. It's a it's a kind of a complicated. Uh, uh, parking and traffic uh, scenario. Uh, it's been before uh, your uh, engineer, the traffic engineer, Beta, uh, who had uh, two comments. John Canning from Kinley, Kimley Horn, the school's traffic consultant, is here to talk big picture about traffic and parking and also to respond to the comments uh, from Beta. Is he also going to, Mr. Cohen, address uh, drop off and pick up by by the parents dropping off children okay that's part of his presentation all right yes yeah Thank you, Bruce. For the record, my name is John Canning. I work for Kimberly Horn. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, so obviously, as you're aware, uh, this is a relocation of an existing facility, so it will not introduce any additional trips to the town of Greenwich. Uh, there's no change in staffing or enrollment, so also there will be no additional trips. Uh, the move involves a move of less than a half a mile from North Maple Avenue, basically down the road to the other side. So yes, sir. Mr. Kenning, stop right there. Yes, sir. No new additional trips, and with the staffing enrollment, no new additional trips. I want to make sure that I understand that there's no new additional trips to the site because that to the main site because that's where the Cowan Center is now. But there will be additional trips down the street. That's correct. To where the new site is. That's correct. And okay. Then, Thank you. And then while you're at it, we're going to right away want to ask you what about the discrepancy between your your trips generated number and what our consultant came up with. Um, particularly since our consultant finds it to be a higher number of trips that will sure. be generated. Sure. So issue number three, that's where you left off. Okay. So by relocating it from north of Patterson to south of Patterson, basically you move the uh, Cowan Center traffic from that location from north of Patterson on North Maple to okay. south of Patterson. Okay. Today, motorists approach from the north on Ma North Maple. They approach from the south on Maple. A few approach from the east on North Street, and a few approach from the, actually a good number approach from the west on uh, Patterson, because you can cut through from um, the neighborhood. So what it means, basically, is the people from the north will still come from the north. The people from the south will still come from the south. There'll be no change in traffic, basically, between the site, uh, or be below the site, 
or below the current site, above the current site, because that's those people will stay the same. The people coming in on north, instead of going up, will go down. And the people coming in on Patterson, okay. instead of going up north, Babel, to the current count center. Okay, you've got to make that a little simpler sounding for me. Sure. <laughs> going up, no, up? No, no, just let Mace him do it. Because I'm, I'm sure that I'm not alone in, right? You kind of went. Mm -hmm. I got okay, it. you one, got it. Yeah. One okay. take the. I, I get it. Okay, they get it. Take the four legs and show sure. what you mean, which I think he's saying. If you come down Patterson, mm -hmm. instead of turning left, you're going to turn right. Exactly. Uh, you're going to have one less Sorry. trip going left and one more going right. So there is an increase in that sense. But if you go through each one of the legs. So if this is North Maple going into Maple. Mm -hmm. This is North Street, it curves around this way. Right, right. This is Patterson, this is the existing facility, and this is the proposed facility. So right now, people come this way. I'm just going to do the ins. Okay. Okay. The outs are kind of the same. People come this way. I hope so. They come this way, and they come this way. Okay. Okay. So today, when, they, when these guys come here, they stop there. These guys go this way, these guys go this way, and these guys continue on up here. Okay. Okay. So, so start the start the south. So what you're no basically change. saying is, look, a lot of the traffic is flowing on the same streets. Yep. There's a little bit that goes differently, but the traffic is basically flowing in exactly the same streets. I wouldn't say exactly, but very close to close exactly. close yes. to that. Yep. There's some that flows differently, but bottom line, the traffic's already in the general vicinity. Correct. Okay. The principal difference with the relocation of the site is for the east-west streets, instead of turning up to go up, they'll go down. They go down. And as a result, you'll have more traffic from Patterson to the site, which is about 300 feet, mm -hmm. and you'll have less traffic from Patterson to the existing site, which is, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, 800 feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll explain later, but the difference is it's about 15 fewer trips here and about 20 more trips here per hour. Does, does that basically explain in an intelligible way. Thank you. But what about teachers getting from the main campus to well, well, the... Well, hold on a second. Let him get to that. That's actually... That's okay. going to be a different kind of snakes. Um, I'll explain the parking a little bit in a moment, but the bottom line is most of the staff will continue to park at Greenwich Academy. So. They're going to Greenwich Academy, the main campus now. They'll continue to go to the main campus. So they're not going to increase traffic down at the site. There will be a shuttle in inclement clement weather to bring them down. It'll be either a minivan or one of the small mini school buses that the uh, school currently has. And we'll make sure that it can make the turnaround at the, at the back of the site so they can go in, drop them off, and come back. Mr. Canning, yes. Canning, sorry to interrupt you. Can you clarify? The, the minivan, this shuttle thing, yep. um, we we're trying to kind of understand how that's going to work. That's actually staff who arrive at the main campus, park their cars, and then take the shuttle down to the Cowan Center. Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, correct. Is that staff or is that? That's, that is Cowan Center faculty and staff, people that work at the Cowan Center, either caring for the children or administering. Okay, it's not parents bringing, or fac faculty parents bringing their children. That is correct. Okay, that's I think was one of the well, biggest questions. Actually, while you're there, and I know we're digressing you a tiny bit, but what it began to seem to us as we tried to figure the numbers out yesterday was that really very few of the kids are coming from Greenwich Academy, that there's 19 parking spots that Brunswick, some, somebody stop me if I get this wrong, but 19 spots from Brunswick to the, that Brunswick is doing. And so there's 50 kids. And then how many are actually, how many are actually coming out of those 50 from the academy? Because that was what was, we were trying to it's back a, it's into a, it's that a, it's number. You were issue. backing into that number yesterday, right, Dave? And what'd you so, finally so get? Bef before we, we get to that, Okay. All, all of the children will be dropped off and picked up in the vicinity of the new facility, assuming this board approves it. None of them will be dropped off up at the campus. Okay, so all of the children down. arrive to the site yes. in, in their parents' car. Right. So when, when they arrive, um, parents will have the option of either parking and walking their children in, and the same on leaving, or if their children are a little more independent, 
or if they're asleep and they don't want to wake them, they can pull into the site, there's a turnaround at the back, turn around, drive out through the port cashier, stop, and there'll be an attend a, a staff member there who will sign the child, child in, take the child in, and then that parent will depart. So that's one option. Uh, in addition, Greenwich Academy has reached an agreement with Brunswick that Brunswick teachers, or Brun Brunswick staff people, will drive down and drive into 116, which is immediately next door, and park in one of the 19 spaces that Brunswick said they would make available there for their teachers who have children at the Cowan Center. So Brunswick teachers who have children at the Cowan Center <coughs> will drive down to 116, drive, park there, and walk around, walk their children in, and walk their children out. So that leaves Greenwich Academy staff who have children at the facility and the community uh, parents, so basically the excess capacity that's not taken up by faculty and staff of the academy or the school is offered to the uh, parents of students in Brunswick or in, um, in Greenwich Academy. So those parents and uh, the Greenwich Academy staff will drive down, will drive into the facility, and they'll park in the spaces in front. Well, if they don't drive through the drop-off area, walk their children in and walk their children out. Uh, with regard to the specific numbers, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Yasky. Uh, you mentioned that there's 20 more trips that, in that area. That's called the prime area we're concerned about, right? Does that include these Brunswick drop-offs? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, it does. Okay. Does it also then include Which is the 19. shuttle over from the main campus? Uh, I, I can't say for certain that it does, but the shuttle would be one or two trips. So the 19 spaces and the 20 additional trips, uh, a large part of that uh, might, might be Brunswick? I mean, I don't know how many... So it's my understanding, and uh, Molly, correct me if I'm mistaken, that of the 60 kids, I believe 19 are... Brunswick affiliated, that would be Brunswick staff. So 19 would be Brunswick staff, leaving 41 who are either Greenwich Academy or community. And would you by any chance know what percent of that, of the 41 that you're referring to, would be Greenwich Academy versus community? It's right here in black and white in front of me now, 27. 27 are from the community? 20, no, no, 27 are from Greenwich Academy. I'm sorry, I misunderstood okay. your question. So. 27 from 41 is 14 are from the community. Okay. Including so Brunswick. Yep. They could be Brunswick or Greenwich Academy community parents. So 27 from GA, 19 from, from Brunswick, yep. and 14 okay. uh, affiliated. Affiliated, exactly. So you're probably going to get somebody to stand up again and bring you a piece of paper. So one of the things we were trying to figure out yesterday is how many of the kids are Greenwich Academy kids of the teachers, Greenwich Academy faculty so, kids. So because if, that's if, the that's presented need for this facility is the importance to the academy for being able to recruit teachers. So we were curious what number of children actually belong to the teachers at the academy. Did well, we just answered that? I, I, no, we answered that it was 27 from the broader total of parents and so okay. it was I said 27 Greenwich Academy that could be a teacher or it or could a be a parent. No, no, it could be a teacher or a staff member. Okay, so 27 out of the so almost so we're like 40% is half. that right? 30 is half, so 27. Okay. okay. Then how many are the affiliates then? The affiliates are 14. Oh, okay. This is a, like a math quiz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the question was also, I mean, that's the way it is today. Right. Yes. Yeah, it's not the number we got For yesterday. some reason, Brunswick builds its own child care or something, right? That might go away. Mm, good point. Yes. There, the future has endless numbers of possibilities, I that guess. Is the, that's the area that yeah, I, I'm with you the leg I'm with you about the numbers I'm with you about yep uh, that the way the trips are changing but I'm not with you about the fact that that's the way it is today and it could change in the future well and uh, you're, uh, everything can change but the, it's been that way for quite a number of years it, the way it that seems it to work for them is that if we see that then we have to anticipate what might happen in the future so we might have to put some conditions on what's going on at this point okay that's all understood thank you 
Um, in addition to the staff parking at Greenwich Academy, the Brunswick staff parking at 116, uh, the Cowan Centre proposes to move its start time from 7.15 to 7 o'clock. Um, why is that important? Well, first of all, the peak hour at the schools is from 7.15 to 8.15. It's a crush. If you've been through the intersections, you know what it's like. The 15 minutes before that, so from 7 to 7.15, there's 47% less traffic passing through those intersections than there is from 7.15 to 7.30. So by moving the start, and, and also 21 of the staff or parents were entered the Cowan Centre when we were there in the two minutes between 7.15 and 7.17. So there's a need to move it forward and by mo or earlier, and by moving it earlier, you're taking those folks out of the peak hour, which goes, which along with parking at the Greenwich Academy and this ch change in time goes to explain the difference between the 72 trips and the 47 trips that you asked about. Gotcha. Um, we did a, a detailed traffic. That's a part of the explanation, right? Or is that the full explanation, that 15 minute differential? And the fact that the staff, uh, most of the staff will be parking at Greenwich Academy and not Okay, so what you did is you didn't actually use ITE because you were using what the, what the use will be. The issue that we would have with that mm -hmm. is just to what Mr. Yeski's question was. So today, it's Greenwich Academy. We asked another proposed daycare center the same question. What happens when the teacher's kids grow up? They're not walking from the campus anymore and now you're maybe taking more from the broader community and you're changing your traffic pattern. So that's why it would make sense to use the ITE as your base case because that is the real picture for a daycare center. Today you have a synergy yep. that the students are parking on, that the, that the mothers are parking on site at the academy, but that may not prevail. So you would be better off, in my mind, at least to, uh, to me, to answer the question, what's being generated here, is to go ahead and use ITE. Well, I, I would be happy to come back Good. and add the 14 trips. Yeah, and just, I mean, give it to us as, what happens if everybody stops having young children at the academy? Maybe not likely, but the base case should be ITE. Sure. Okay. Okay. Or, or the other option is, at some point, we put a condition on about how many children? Oh, you, you've got to have children if you go it's to It's not how, how many, children many children each family can have. How many is children it? you can accept from affiliated Understood. Uh, parents? Yep. That's where I was going. No, don't throw it at me. Just hand it to me. <laughs> Nick's in charge of hitting me. I'm all in favor of having children. Was that on the record, sir? Yeah, that, uh, please don't. <laughs> so, put, so put this as the headline, I'm in favor of grandchildren. <laughs> okay. So from a parking perspective, um, there are currently about eight parking spaces on the site. It's proposed to increase that number to 17, I believe. Um, four of them would be designated for the two apartments. That's two per, in accordance with the code leaving four from 17, 13 uh, to accommodate uh, parking for the parents who park and walk their children in. Um, and there'll be a few extra spaces for staff, probably for the administra administrator um, and a, a assistant administrator. The spaces in the front will be for parents so they can drive in their perpendicular spaces, park, back out, and drive out. It, it, Okay, can I stop you there? Yes. Th that that was my earlier question. Mr. Cohen had a map of the current layout. It would be helpful. I think I now begin to see part of your solution, which is the, the amount of space required for this many children to be dropped off in a 15-minute period uh, is, that, is that driveway run up and the roundabout at this point in time. But... You're now suggesting a deal next door with Brunswick. They're going to walk the or they're going to carry the children or walk, right? 
So yes. take us through that. If, sure. If, if where you are now, forget what we just said about it might change. Yes. But you have a deal with Brunswick that is going to alleviate the drop-off area. As right. Well. Okay. So uh, I, I'll just sort of back up through it with the plan. Sorry. I'm blocking it a little bit. Um, if you want to drop your kid off, if they're a little more independent or if they're asleep, you drive in, you turn around, you pull up to the port cashier, you sign them in, and you leave. And the pickup is pretty much the same. How many, how many in a typical morning would that be? Um, based on your current numbers. We so understand ba it can based, based on our current numbers, the most parents we had at the existing count facility at any time was 10. So, it, it, you know, the kids get dropped off sequentially. They don't all show up at the same time. Uh, but it takes a few minutes to drop your child off. So we did some survey, door, doorway surveys where we recorded the number of people coming in and the number of people going out. And the most uh, parents that we had at the count center at any time dropping their children off was 10. So even though there's 60 kids, there was never more than 10 of them there at any one time. Being dropped off. Being dropped off. Is this in your report? I believe it is. It's very hard to read those reports. <laughs> No, com no comment. <laughs> um, for the parents, for the Brun yes, no, that's it, for, for Brunswick staff, they will come up Maple Avenue, come down Maple Avenue, turn into 116. There's some s parking spaces here or here. They'll park. There's a sidewalk. They'll walk down. I thought our sidewalk extended in here. I'll have to have a look at that. Uh, and they'll walk in and drop their kids off and walk out. Those Brunswick parents now. These are Brunswick, these are Brunswick staff. Right. They're, they would be part of the 10 that you talked about because they would have to have dropped them off at the existing Cowan Center, they right? They do now, yes. So they're part of the 10. They would be eliminated from that drop-off area. Yes. They would be eliminated from that drop-off area. Is that in your report? It is. And the, one of the other things that's in the application, though, is that Brunswick had written that they would, that they have no problem with the 19 children or families yes. um, that work at Brunswick now using the parking spaces at Brunswick. But to the point that Mr. Yeske was raising, it's 19 today. It could be two tomorrow. It could be 30 the next day. So and then what it's do you do? a little odd that they are making this comment based on the condition that it is today. So I think that needs to be adjusted somehow. I mean, I think it's, it's not, this isn't, a, this isn't something we condition. say to you, I think, but that we would, from what you're saying, we would have to condition, ask that Brunswick do it in perpetuity, 19 spaces, regardless of how many kids from Brunswick are at Cohen, because that's the basic assumption, again. Well, which is also problematic, though, because it happens to be those 19 teachers that are going to Brunswick anyway. Right. So it could be two teachers that are that are at Brunswick and then 19 people that are from the outside exactly showing up at Brunswick oh, and, and you already have those 19 you know you have those 17 spaces taken up by other teachers so you've got a problem there because you're assuming a situation right now is going to continue and again it's back to that ITE thing I think you've got to figure out a way of those 19 spaces yeah they have to be completely available and Brunswick's got to not need them for their faculty or just make that site work without Brunswick, and Brunswick is just a nice yeah, yeah, a nice thing if it works but, out. But can the site function without the Brunswick component? But then your question is, and I think I saw this in your report, I believe you can queue seven cars? Correct. Six now, because we moved the roundabout a little bit. Okay, so you can queue six cars, but you said that your observation is your drop-off at the existing Cohen can be up to 10. Correct. You're really getting tight. I realize you're doing the 15 minute, you're spreading out the drop, but you're still getting tight on your queuing space, and especially if you can't count on always having 19 spaces from Brunswick. Uh, two, two points on that. It's, so there's eight spaces in front, so eight and six is 14, so it's four more than 10. And the 19 spaces for Brunswick Brunswick offered the 19 spaces. We don't need all 19 because, as I said before, Today. with 60 kids, the most at any one time was 10. So if you figure, you know. Today. Today. But those parents. No, no, no but if, if of the 19 spaces, basically, probably, 
Let me see. I'm trying to do mental math here. No, you know, you, you can, but you Probably get a group. You're not going to have more than four Brunswick folks parked here at any one time. So if they're not Brunswick, it'll be only four more in here. But um, how did you get there? We don't need 19 spaces. Brunswick offered us 19, one for every family, but they don't all show up at the same time. So of the 19, you probably only have four show up at, this, at okay. the same time. And if those four Brunswick folks are no longer, they're somewhere else, then it's only four but people you we need have to here. do something that works no matter what happens. Understood. We, we will. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think I, I, my own take is, I can't think of a better way of saying it, but this is kind of complicated, all these arrangements. It sure would be nicer if it was more straightforward. Because it's like, well, okay, so these people are going to park over here. Yep. And that to us is, we're not good at that. I'm not good at that. Sorry, I shouldn't speak for them, but I struggle with that. So yeah, if you can figure out a way of making it clean. Right. Okay. I think about that, I'll offer two thoughts. Number okay. one, we live in a sustainable world which requires that you share resources and do, do double duty. We got no problem with that, right. at least I don't. Uh, and number two, um, we have divided it up so it's pretty straightforward. If you're a Brunswick parent, you know what you do. You do the same thing every day. If you're a Greenwich Academy parent, you do the same thing that you do every day. So we're going to look at it and get back to you. But, but just the to biggest those issue thoughts. that keeps coming out is you took a picture in time and said this is what we're going to plan for. And it's a picture that's a highly changeable one, so you can't just plan for that. Right. Well, I'll, I'll have to have the school speak to how you, changeable it has been in the past and what their expectations are for the future. And if, I mean, one, one person told us, we had a daycare that told us that their teachers left when their kids weren't in daycare anymore, so. Uh, Mr. Cannon, <laughs> before, you, before you flip it over, can you go back to your original, um, quick question on that. Yeah. Um, uh, point five, um, forensic staff, Maple Avenue, reducing traffic at uh, 96, and availing of police officer at peak hours. Um, the police officer is going to stay, do you, or you can confirm that the police officer is going to be available at Brunswick in perpetuity for the project? Unless and until Brunswick changes their use of that parking lot. Right now they use that as a staging area and a drop-off area for their children uh, to bus them from the Mar Avenue campus, the King Street campus, and we did surveys of the driveway, and there's something like 80 parents drive in there in the morning and 80 parents drive out of there, which is why they have the police officer. So I would imagine that as long as, as Brunswick intends to do that, the police officer will, will be there if there's no need for a police officer because those numbers drop and they do something else, the police okay. officer. But having the police officer there is not intrinsic to how you're foreseeing the, the, the traffic and the parking work? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just to leave you with a couple of thoughts. So this is a survey of the number of trips and the accumulative parking at the existing facility. I don't so remember seeing that. That I don't remember seeing. No, that this was, I prepared this for tonight. Do you think you could make it small and give it, give us a copy, send them, you can email it to Katie for the record. I have it back there. I, I have a copy here, I'll give okay. it to you. So basically this is by each 15 minute period, uh, excuse me, each five minute period okay. in the morning. And so right now you can see uh, in any five minute period there's no more than 10 trips. And it's kind of spread out. It's this, this is not like a nursery school where there's a set start time and a set finish time. Yes, the parents have to be at school, but there's two schools and there's parents of the community, so it spreads it out and the current peak parking demand, the bottom line is staff, so it went up to 13 when we were there, and the top line is the parents on top of it, and the difference, the maximum difference was 10. So when you take the staff and park them at Greenwich Academy, and you take the Brunswick staff who have children at Cowan and park them at Brunswick, if I can do this without knocking it over. This is the level of traffic activity you will have at the new facility every 15 minutes. The, the biggest number is six trips in uh, every five minutes, I beg your pardon. The biggest number is six trips in five minutes. So it's basically one trip a minute. Um, the maximum accumulation of parking is uh, 
We've got three staff, and uh, then we've got three parkers and uh, four drop-offs, and there's some more in Brunswick. So um, basically, the bottom line is it's really not that busy. We'll be back to you with the 72 instead of the 47, and uh, we'll try and see if we can make it all work in one place. Uh, just remind me, on the drop-off, the five-minute, um, it goes by age of the children, right? I would guess that if the child's old enough to get out of it, is there someone there to help the children get out of the car? Absolutely. Including babies? I understand it's eight weeks, you said? Eight, eight so, weeks? So, so the way it currently works, right, is they don't have a drop-off area. So they have, everybody has to park, and they walk their child inside the building and sign up. And the new one, there will be a staff member for the drop-off. There will be a staff member there. They will help get the baby. The, if the parent wants to get the baby out of the car, the parent can get the baby out of the car, pass it off. Or the, the staff member can reach in and take the child. But if, it's, if it's a toddler that's walking or if it's a baby that's asleep, they can take it in the car seat. They'll make sure they sign the paperwork so that everything is safe and secure. Okay. Folks, more questions? Um, in your observations or your staff's observations of um, the traffic in the neighborhood, yep. um, just, just disregarding what's going to happen with things moving around, yep. um, it seemed that actually because uh, Maple North Street Post Road is, is like the gateway to Greenwich from the Mayor Parkway as a, as a, what I would think is a feeder street. Is that more heavily trafficked in your opinion that because of, because of the, basically the, the one way into town? Well, it certainly is uh, a major avenue into town, but it's not the only one. I mean, you can get off the Merritt coming from the other direction and come down to through Glenville, which I do when I'm coming from White Plains, or you can go up a little bit further and come mm -hmm. down Lake Avenue or Round Hill Road. Um, but it is, there's definitely a lot of traffic that comes in North Street uh, down into town. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of traffic associated with the schools. Right. So it's, it's busy. Okay. Uh, were you part of the, uh, the master planning at all? You, was your firm? I was not, no. Okay. Because um, the question I would have had is actually if, if that traffic that's coming down the, that corridor, does it bleed out into the side streets to avoid the intersections and the... the to avoid, for example, the policemen uh, directing traffic at, at the Brunswick uh, site, or avoid at the stops. You I, know, I don't things, know. So. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Um, something when we did the numbers wasn't ringing right to me. Um, it says here that the Brunswick kids are 23 children out of the total. So, so not 19. Tried to, I tried to fact check that today. Yeah, and but that's what's in Mr. Cohen's letter, and maybe right. Mr. Cohen. So the, the information, the, the information wrong. that was given to me over time, yeah. was that there were 19 families and 23 children. Okay. Okay, but when we, yeah, yeah, so, but so, so I, we I went back 19. to try and fact, fact check that today, and I couldn't find where we actually said that. And the best information that I have, which was provided to me, was that it's 19. No, I've got that, but it's 23 kids. And 19 spaces because some some people have more than one kid. Yes. So, but it's 23 kids. So when we do the math, the number of G. So that would be good to have is G. Just at least have that picture in time today. Yeah. GA we, community we, we will, Brunswick uh, uh, and Brunswick faculty versus Brunswick community. We'll confirm what those numbers were. Okay. Are. Okay. Now, once again, other people. I know this is in your report. When Sorry. did you do the testing and the sampling? I know uh, this one's in your report. Right. We, we did the initial traffic <coughs> counts, I would say, it was either late May or September, and then we did a, the sampling, <coughs> I'd say, October or early November at the, at the count center. I'd have to go back and look. Okay. To be well, specific. Good enough. well, Mr. Kenning, I think we've certainly given you full employment. Something to think about. So, um, Thank does you. anybody else have any questions to, for Mr. Canning? No? Going once? Not today. Okay, not today. Um, I'm not, there he is. Um, Mr. Cohen, would you be ready? I know we've got other items, but would you be ready for public comment now? Do you want to stop yes. and do that? I'm stop. And um, by the way, um, 
I did want to compliment you on something. The photographs, I know you're stunned. The photographs are fabulous. I loved all the old pictures of the academy and what the neighborhood looked like. Those were really wonderful. Um, is that Peter Levy's going to do, or are you going to do, do it? it? Are you okay? So, who's your first person? I believe is Mrs. Um, Ellen Brennan Galvin. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, good evening. Before I start, I just wanted to say, um, listening to the young. My name is Ellen Brennan Galvin. I'm a member of RTM District 7, and I'm secretary of the Town of Greenwich Land Use Committee. Um, the young woman speaking on the behalf of Greenwich Academy, warm and fuzzy is wonderful, and I'm sure the Cowan Center is a wonderful place, but the question before us is where it should be located, and I think we need to focus very much on that. As we've been told, 96 Maple Avenue, home of the late attorney Harry Constance, was granted historic overlay zoning in 1979. This enabled Mr. Constance, as we've been told, to receive one bonus use for his property, thereby converting a single family residence on 0.6 acres in an R20 zone into a two family residence. My first point, I am very familiar with these regulations since Mr. Constas served as our attorney when we sought historic overlay zoning on our property at 136 Maple Avenue in the mid 1990s. Again, enabling us to obtain the single bonus use of a legal apartment. With this history, I am somewhat confused by this application. Now in a property in which the single bonus apartment was already approved 40 years ago, and Mr. Constance's request for a second accessory apartment was declined in 1989 on the grounds that, quote, multiple accessory impacts would result in adverse impacts. Greenwich Academy proposes to install two three-bedroom apartments, a daycare center for 60 students, a staff of 18, and attendant offices. The small abutting property at 100 Maple Avenue which sits on around 0.4 acres will become will house another GA family. If the request for the merging of the properties goes forward, the front yard of 100 Maple will serve as the area for the turnaround of cars entering the property to drop off students, as well as parking for the daycare and administrative staff, residents of the 296 Maple Avenue apartments and the 100 Maple Avenue residents. Built in 1962, 100 Maple Avenue is of no historic value. If by combining the 96 and 100 Maple Avenue lots, this property benefits from historic overlay zoning, that truly would be a travesty. It would appear that is not the case. However, during their November 14th deliberations, members of the Historic District Commission were unsure about whether the HO would apply to 100 Maple and ask for clarification on this matter. This leads to my second point and another subject of confusion. In obtaining historic overlay zoning, the major requirement we faced was to preserve the streetscape, maintaining our property in a manner consistent with its historic origins. Toward this end, over the years, we have gone before the Historic District Commission on three occasions seeking permission for exterior cosmetic changes. Maintaining the historic streetscape is hardly what is planned for the proposed 96100 Maple Avenue property. In fact, HDC at the November 14th meeting unanimously rejected GA's proposal for the site, not the house, the site. Its motion read, quote, Landscaping and parking are not compatible with the intended original approved HO of the two residence units." Unquote. Today, 100 Maple is largely hidden from the road by a green canyon, mature trees abutting the Brunswick parking lot, which is approximately 10 feet away from the proposed new driveway. The trees along the Brunswick GA property line will be cut down as well as the mature trees that almost completely obscure the property in the rear. Cutting down all these trees and constructing a new macadam driveway lined by many angled parking spaces. I'm not quite sure how many. There are going to be 17, a couple of perpendicular, so there are probably around a dozen. 
angled parking spaces in the manner of Greenwich Avenue. This is hardly consistent with maintaining the streetscape of a 1904 property in a residential neighborhood. The proposed playground for the older children, which was going to be visible from the street and therefore would have affected the historic streetscape, is now going to be moved. I thought it was to the backyard of 100 Maple, um, but I'm not sure, Mr. Cohen said that may have changed, thereby probably affecting the status as its status as a single family residence. The second playground for the younger children will be off to the side of 96 Maple. I assume that it is the practice of planning and zoning, just as it is with other agencies and commissions, such as wetlands and HDC, to conduct occasional site visits. A site visit would really be important, truly an eye-opener with so many proposed uses for such a confined space. My third point, and possibly the most important, has to do with traffic. The traffic study conducted by Kinsley Horn and Association is so deeply flawed as to be laughable, even insulting. The premise of the study is that the current Cowan Center at 200 North Maple will have the same enrollment, 60 children and 18 staff, and is only to be moved half a mile. Hence, there would be no change in the traffic impact. Equating North Maple Avenue, a hilly winding connector road between Lake Avenue and North Street with the North Street Maple Avenue corridor, which is the major artery into downtown Greenwich, is truly ridiculous. This corridor not only accommodates the heavy vehicular traffic from the Merritt and beyond, but also the steady stream of commercial and heavy construction vehicles. They do not take North Maple. My fourth point has to do with parking, a subject that I will deal with only very briefly or else we will be here all evening. GA recently reduced the number of on-site parking spaces from 20 to 17 and the number of drop-off queuing spaces from seven to six hardly a major selling point for the neighbors. We have been told that Brunswick will make available a further 19 spaces. Is that in writing? This number is a moving target since it provides spaces for the 19 Brunswick faculty children currently using the center. We've also been told that during inclement weather, staff will be bused from the GI campus, but that's only 18 people. Lastly, GA has made a big point of enabling parents and children to walk to the center. Really? In my experience, walking babies and toddlers a half a mile or so poses certain challenges. I have 10 grandchildren. Um, my fifth and final point, in communications to the neighbors from attorney Bruce Cohen, it was emphasized that Maple Avenue already has, quote, a largely institutional feel, unquote. The implication being that the proposed mixed-use property at 96100 Maple Avenue would be in keeping with the neighborhood. On the contrary, there are 35 residential properties with Maple Avenue addresses, many tucked behind the houses lining the street on the one-third of a mile between Patterson and Putnam Avenues. With the exception of long-established properties such as the Stanton House Inn, Many of these date from the early 20th century or late 19th century. The Women's Club, 1906, the former Junior League Building, 1925, the entrance to the former Brunswick Lower School, which is where GA was originally sited, and the two doctor's offices near Putnam Avenue. Maple Avenue, again, is a densely populated residential area with 35 houses. The last construction of a non-residential building on Maple Avenue was the small doctor's office at the intersection of Maple and Patterson Avenue, built in 1984, 35 years ago. In conclusion, where successive plans of conservation and development have emphasized the key mission of preserving residential neighborhoods, what GA is now proposing is exactly the opposite. Four Maple Avenue property owners most affected by this proposal, number 64, 92, 107 and our home, 136, have lived on the street for a combined total of more than 125 years. Long-term residents and newer residents who have bought or rebuilt expensive houses should not be forced to hire costly lawyers to preserve their quality of life. This is truly a case of David versus Goliath. 
Greenwich Academy has net assets of somewhere in the vicinity of $200 million and is currently in the process of conducting a $75 million capital campaign. It is time to draw a red line and stop the encroachment of an extremely wealthy private school, in effect a profitable business, from changing the character of our residential neighborhoods. Thank you. That's the one. Okay. Um, my wooden mic. <coughs> yeah, but that's just something we can look at. Fulton. Uh, good evening. You didn't even call him. He just came. Yeah, he's like that. I had a, I had an instinct, but anyway. Good evening, Madam Chairman and members of the Commission. Happy New Year to you all. Uh, God, I wanted to stand up one minute, one hour and 57 minutes ago. What? James Fulton, F-U-L-T-O-N, like the fish market. Um, I wanted to stand up one hour and 57 minutes ago and say, my God, Mrs. Alban, your instincts about the HO zone and the HO regulations are precisely correct. I am going to ask you to decide this application to tonight. I am going to ask you to deny this application tonight because as a matter of law, the building zone regulations, specifically the HO regulations, do not allow this application to be granted. It would be most unfortunate and most unnecessary to make the applicant spend one more hour and one more dollar on an application that as a matter of law may not be granted. Mr. Macri, would you kindly take one and pass to your right? Mrs. Alban, would you kindly take one and pass to your left? Brother Cohen. As we all know, this property has already received an, an HO designation and must continue to abide by the HO regulations. Things that property owners are required to do in an HO zone are set out in 6 109C of the regulations entitled Standards and things that property owners may be allowed to do in an HO zone are set out in 6-109D of the regulations entitled incentives. This application must be denied as a matter of law because the applicant seeks to do something that the regulations do not allow it to do. In the R20HO zone, the regulations do not allow changes to a non-residential use. Yes, um, I represent the Maple Avenue Association, LLC. Is that, who is that? Is that in the butter? That's not correct. Uh, okay. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Stop, stop. Um, you guys all know that if you want to make a comment, you got to talk to us. Right. I, I represent an LLC that was formed very, very recently. Okay. And some and people. I don't believe that you remember. Okay, please, Mr. Fulton, address the commission. Okay. But are they, are they abutting property owners or are they people in the. Just They're people here in the audience. 
the own property in the town of Greenwich? Yes, on Maple Avenue. That's why they're called the Maple Avenue Association, LLC. Okay. Now, if I may return. Moving along. 6-109D states that for structures on sites in any of these residential zones, the Planning and Zoning Commission may authorize additional dwelling units in existing buildings or structures and or in new construction that's complementary and secondary to the historic structures. Our courts have held over and over again. When considering an application for a special exception, a zoning authority acts in an administrative capacity and its function is to, ter to determine whether the proposed use is expressly permitted under the regulations. Here, it is not. Question, Mr. Fulton. Special exception is the same thing as special permit in this context. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. As, uh, uh, zoning regulations are in derogation of common law. They may not be stretched beyond the fair import of their language and they must uh, and, and, and to include or exclude by implication that which is not clearly within its expressed terms and then one of my favorite cases the Azarito case which I brought to Mr. Levy's particular attention last month when we were talking about the Chabad Lubavitch application regulation should not be extended by implication beyond their expressed terms the express terms of 6-109D only allow a special permit to be granted for a new non-residential use when the property is within a thousand feet of a residential zone. This property is not. My friend Mr. Haslin will actually give you an exhibit to show where the thousand foot mark is. For structures on sites in residential zones not more than 1,000 feet from a business zone, then and only then under the express terms of this regulation, you may authorize all uses permitted by right. You may authorize special permit uses i.e. 6-94A5, or you may or you may authorize an office use. Under the express terms of 6-109D, you may only allow a non-residential use when the site is not more than a thousand feet from an adjacent non-residential zone. Excuse me, Mr. Fulton, just for a sec. Katie, in this, in 6109, what we say is we vary the regulations. That these are, oh, just lost my space. Not, not vary. I'm right sorry, sentence. may allow the following modifications. My bad, bad English. We allow modifications, and then the modifications are, are listed. Those are modifications from the regulations. But in fact, the school use is permitted in a residential zone. So it would not require a modification of the existing regulations. So 6109 would not necessarily apply. Am I misreading that? You I'm see not what sure I'm, I'm understanding what, what, what I'm you're saying asking, is that they are not requesting the modification of the regulations here. Right. So no and there is no ability to do that. There's incentives provided the, under the HO zone. But the underlying Mr. Mr. Fulton's comments are that this wouldn't this this wouldn't be applicable under the one oh nine. However, Mr. Cohen's point is that he's not applying under this section of the regulations at all, he's applying under, under, the under exactly as, and under um, as under six dash ninety four, which permits um, which permits the use which permits the use which in a residential zone. Look yeah. At whether or not something is compliant 
under those so mr um, even mr cohen knows something that you may not know really yes which is that it is a universal principle of law that specific regulations apply over more general ones. So whereas 6-94A5 might apply in any residential zone, when you're dealing with a residential HO zone, the more specific regulation must apply. And as the court state your job is to determine the function is to determine whether the proposed use is expressly permitted under those regulations under your ho regulations this use is expressly permitted only when it's not more than a thousand feet from a business owned boundary Mr. Fulton, can you explain this? Um, Katie, a deeper what is the is radius of that circle? The 1,000. The, the radius of that circle is 1,000 feet. Yes. Okay. So we apply. So you're saying which regulation is more specific? The, the HO regulation, because yeah. look, the 6 94A5 applies to all residential zones in town. The 6-109 applies only to residential HO zones, a much smaller subset. And as a universal principle of law, the specific regulation must control unless it's expressly permitted. If you can find in the HO zone, zoning regulations, where this use is expressly permitted, then you're allowed to consider it. I can only find a regulation where it's expressly permitted when it's not more than a thousand feet from the adjacent zone. That's all I can find. Now I'd like to go on to a different point. Even if this property were not in an HO zone, and this was something that I think Mrs. Alban was, was having difficulty with, Valid authority under the regulations to modify, oh, excuse me, I went to page three. I meant to go to page two, didn't I? Even, even if the regulations did grant express authority to permit a non-residential use in an R20 HO zone, if everything I said was just completely wrong, the standards which apply to property in the HO zone regulations were, would not permit what the applicant proposes to do. Those standards in the HO zone, 6-109C, says the historic character of the property shall be retained and preserved. The removal, alteration of features, spaces, and spatial relationships that characterize the property. I want to repeat that. Features, spaces, and spatial relationships that characterize the property will be avoided. New additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction shall not destroy historic materials, features, and spatial relationships that characterize the property. What this application proposes to do is to destroy and replace every single spatial relationship on 96 Maple Avenue. Every one. The historic character of the property is purely residential, and uh, the HO designation granted in 1979 was to preserve and perpetuate a residential use, not a school for 60 children, 16 teachers, and two administrators. Moreover, let's look at those features and spatial relationships for a moment, may we? Those features and spatial relationships that characterize the property do not include a 43,360 square foot lot with two buildings on it. They only contemplate a lot that's 26,000 square feet in size with a single building on it. 
They do not include a parking lot, like the applicant is proposing for 17 cars on the north side of the property, plus six queuing spaces. Those spatial relationships do not include any playground, like the two proposed by the applicant, that which also contain playground equipment. And those spatial relationships do not include fences and walls of, of any kind. Every single spatial relationship on this property is slated to be destroyed and replaced by this application. Everyone. The next page. Even if this, if this property were not in an HO zone, valid authority under the regulations to modify the on-site parking requirement has not existed since October 15th of 2013, the date the Connecticut Appellate Court decided McKenzie versus Planning and Zoning Commission of Monroe, about which I wrote you two letters in the Chabad Lebovich application subsequently adopted by Judge Modelies in the modern tire recapping case. If you have a, if, here's another good reason to deny this application. If you grant it, or <coughs> the regulation in 6-158 that allows you to modify the parking requirements is going to be struck down along with the application. You may not want to see that happen. And the last thing that I have to say is the only way to, at this time, allow a merger of these two properties would, agree, would be to agree to have a single lot zoned half one thing and half another thing. 96 Maple Avenue is, of course, in the HO zone. The home at 100 Maple Avenue was built in 1960, cannot qualify for the HO zone designation. This would be an exercise in extremely unsound land use planning to have a single lot, half in one zone and half in another. And I encourage you not to engage in unsound land use planning. Uh, that's all I have to say. Now, uh, Brother Haslett, I think, is going to say. Uh, Mr. Fulton, before you step down. Oh, yes. You're citing, uh, you're citing section C of 109, 109C. 6-109C. Standards. Yep. Three. Historic character. Um, as I read the regulation, the standards apply when considering an application for an HO zone. We already have an HO zone on this property, don't we? You do. So, the standards the standards apply when I'm are effective when I'm applying for an HO, not when I already have an HO. Uh, Wouldn't you I, agree? I, I respectfully disagree with that, Mr. Macri. Okay. I'm not considering an HO. I'm not considering an HO. I already have one already. That's right. Yes. No. That's what yes. was presented to me. I have an HO on a piece of property. But, but let me say this. If, if, pretty if, smart for a basis. If, 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 if the property would not qualify for an HO application tonight, certainly it doesn't meet the requirements of the HO zone tonight. If these are the purposes of the HO zone, it says that the purposes of the HO zone is to preserve historic properties character, spaces, and spatial relationships. That's the purpose of the HO zone. I don't think the court's going to buy the argument, well, it only applies when you're applying for an HO zone, but the purposes of the HO zone, we can throw out the window once we've already got an HO zone and we want to make changes within it. I don't think the court's going to adopt that argument. Respectfully. Okay, because I'm actually your additional argument about the spatial relationships. Um, the way I seem to read this is that we're talking about the preservation of a of a structure. Um, yes, there are a lot of changes on this site, but we're actually, as I understand from the application, 
the historic structure is being actually restored to its original uh, Yes, they're not, they're not doing much to the house itself. No. So I'm not, losing, the, I'm not losing the house. The house is placed in a space. It's completely surrounded by, or almost completely surrounded by grass and beautiful trees. That's going to be gone. That's going to be gone and replaced with playgrounds, fences, walls that aren't there now, a parking lot. I'm reminded of Joni Mitchell, who used to, who used to sing, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. That's, uh, that's what's being proposed here. The spaces around the house are conducive to its residential quaintness. The spaces that these, that is being around the house that are proposed now, are not. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Um, who's next? Mr. Haslam. Quick, before they gallop up here. Oh. <laughs> uh, good evening, uh, Chip Haslam, I'm Johnson Haslam and Hogan. I represent uh, Kim and Andy Gazelle, who are in the room over here. They live at 77 Maple Avenue, which is a brick house right across the street from uh, Stanton House, a little bit uh, down from Brunswick, not very far, uh, or rather from this property. Um, just by way of background, I knew Harry Constis, uh, ran into him 30 some odd years ago when I was actually representing the Brunswick School when they were trying to get approvals to make improvements to their uh, lower school, um, which is the one that's proposed to be used for parking uh, by uh, French Academy's new big here, so 116 Maple Avenue. And that was in the late 80s, is the early 90s. It was my first land use matter, as I recall, and I was kind of, it was baptism by fire. Um, because it went on for, I think, three years, um, at which time I was really fighting Mr. Constance most of the time, who uh, felt that uh, even though Brunswick's, there was a school use there, and had historically been a school use there, and Brunswick was just adding a, to that building, uh, nonetheless, that it was an encroachment into the neighborhood that was going to wreck the residential character of Maple Avenue. And uh, he and, and the Blooms, and Ed Bloom was here tonight, Ed Bloom and his wife, um, also opposed that vociferously for two or three years uh, while we argued about it. And ultimately, um, we succeeded after trial in court, and I don't think it went up on appeal to the appellate court. I think cert was denied. But there was a lot of conditions that were placed in the use of that property, including there was an enrollment cap for Brunswick that came out of that. There was staggering that had to be done uh, for drop-off in that area there. Um, number of cars that come in on any particular time. There was uh, uh, representations made that there was going to be busing that was going to be done to relieve it, et cetera. So there was a lot of conditions placed on that property. And I'm not sure if that's been forgotten here in the wash when it's proposed now that there's going to be set aside for parking for this facility now right next door at Brunswick. But um, I also want to make the point, the reason why I brought up that story is the fact that this community has not really changed much since back in the late 80s. All Senate. those institutions that Mr. Cohen referred to existed back then, and there have been no other institutional uses that have been introduced into the Maple Avenue community. So uh, I, I believe, in fact, prior to that, for decades, there's been nothing other than there was a dentist office, I believe, that was put on down in the corner of the Post Road in Maple that was illegally built, and the, the guy had to rent out to a nonprofit for 10 years as punishment for having built that building. Other than that, there's been no new um, institutional facilities that have been introduced to Maple Avenue in decades. You yeah, have Mrs. Church. Brennan Galvin made the same point, and, and I had true. asked Katie to get a copy of what the, all the different constructions were because, um, yeah. Yep. So it has maintained its residential quality with some grandfathered uses yeah. and some special exception uses. By permitting GA to build what is really a new school at this facility that's going to be serving GA and, and uh, Brunswick uh, parents and teachers and possibly others if they, don't, if they have vacancies, we don't know, you're expanding into this residential community and threatening what has so far been a pretty good balance between the residential aspects of it and the institutional aspects of it that have been there for many, many years. To characterize it as an institutional area is just, I think, wrong. And I don't think it's supported by the facts. As you can see, there are many beautiful residences, such as the Gazelles, uh, along Maple Avenue in the immediate area. And I think you've got to protect that balance. I think this is an encroachment. I think you're allowing 
GA basically to push their facility up or down the street, basically, to, into this residential zone when they have a facility already they could renovate, they could use. Why don't they do that? Because they want the additional FAR for their arts center, for other purposes, et cetera. So I don't think you should permit this to happen. Now, I should also state that I do happen to agree with Attorney Fulton. I don't always agree with Ful Attorney Fulton. Um, but I think that his interpretation of the regs are correct that, uh, and I think it's also the intent of the regs, that if, if you have a commercial use, you have to be within a thousand feet of a commercial zone to justify it um, in, uh, in an HO. And this is an HO. Attorney Constance struck his deal 40 or so odd years ago that he wanted two units and he allowed his property to be uh, basically um, restricted in perpetuity to be an HO. And that meant with certain limitations. And that was for two dwelling units and he knew what he was bargaining for. He made his deal. Later on, he was able to convince the zoning enforcement officer that he was also entitled to a, a resident professional office, which he got too. But as you know, as you stated previously, the idea of even having an elderly accessory apartment was turned down as being too impactful on the community. So now you have, I think, GA really wanted to double dip. They want the dwelling units that are permitted under the HO designation. In fact, they want three dwelling units. That's fine. <coughs> Should they be permitted? But on top of that, bless you, on top of that, they want this institutional use of 60 kids and all that entails of a daycare center in this location. So I think it's double dipping. And as I said, Attorney Constance, he made his deal. And his family, when they sold the property to GA, GA knew what the deal was, that there was an HO restriction on this. And that should be upheld. To allow it to you know, expand into something else, a hybrid of, well, you got special permit use over here, but you also have the HO over, over here. I don't think that's the intent of the regulations. And I don't think it was intent back in 1979 when the HO was, was uh, permitted in the first place. So I, I think that on Attorney Fulton's argument, I think this should be denied on its face because it's, it's not permitted. Um, but having said that, if you choose not to do that, um, I'm suggesting to you that it is a terrible encroachment into this residential zone, which I say is a fine balance as it is right now. And it'd be an unfortunate thing to have happen merely to accommodate the GA's wishes to move out of the current Cowan Center down the street and have something uh, grander or brighter or less smelly, I should say. And uh, uh, which is a comment by Ms. Mom, King, Mrs. Right? King, yes, right. we heard it. Not making aspersions. Um, and also to get the better FAR up the street as well. And I also question, I'm not a traffic expert, I think you can make your own observations about what's happening at the intersection. It's a very crazy intersection. And uh, people, I drive through it twice a day myself. Um, there's a lot going on with a lot of different interests all competing with each other and you're adding more to that by allowing cars to turn off Patterson Avenue to the right down south this new facility or to the left off of North Street as they come down to. That's a different way of making that intersection work and I think it's very dangerous to have this additional use on that <coughs> location. Having said that, if you do choose to not deny this and keep it open, um, I've been authorized to hire David Spears, a traffic expert for the Gazelles, my clients, and to have him do another peer review of this. He needs a little time to do that, and I would hope that we'd have until... Um, Mr. Hessen, um, as you know, we asked the traffic consultant yep. to change their assumptions in certain situations. So I would definitely, no matter what we do, I would wait until we have an updated, if we were to leave it open, because we are changing we've asked for it to be based on ITE we've asked for sort of a uh, you you heard it so yeah. I would say there's going to be a different traffic analysis and you know wait till you see what that looks like okay thank you for that suggestion so um Senator Mr. Hansen. Yeah, I, I know other people want to speak so I don't want yeah to yeah I have, I have can you kindly speak to Mr. Cohen's representation that section 694a5 is controlling which allows as an edu uh, educational institution in that zone, and Mr. Fulton's statement under that under 6109, uh, the educational use is not allowed allowed in the zone since the in an HO zone, <coughs> since the zone is greater than a thousand feet from the commercial area. Which of those two uh, regulations prevails? Well, I think that. Uh, Attorney Fulton's right that the second one being more specific prevails. So, Attorney Cohen is correct that in residential zones you can apply the spe what we used to call special exceptions now special permit because your changes um, to allow resident uh, to allow uh, school uses in residential zones. 
Having said that, this particular property has been redesignated as HO. And under 6-109, it says that you can add dwelling units to an HO. So, uh, HO zone has been so designated. And you can add non-residential. Non-residential, it has to be at least within 1,000 feet of commercial zone. And this property is not. And I think that is I keep time. getting stuck on the 6109D language that says to provide incentives to protect historic resources. You may allow the following modifications to the regulations because an incentive is not necessary here in HOs in place, but we already right. in place. And so I do not believe that the incentive section applies to this application, but we will check it with, I'm going to get some more right minds on it um, and you're good good okay thank you anybody want to ask him anything no okay um mrs fox uh would you mind very much ceding your place to mr bloom and letting him go before you thank you mr bloom you go ahead mrs fox has given you precedence over her turn thank you ahmed bloom my wife fell in love at the rear. We've lived right at the scene of your of this issue for forty seven years. And we own the house in back of that, which once was part of ninety six Maple. And we own the house at Three Boxwood Lane, which is a drive, is visible, but, and has a, shares a driveway going past 96 Maple, an open driveway. And I was a, I, I for many years was on the Board of Zoning Appeals, so I know something about this business. And then I was on for years on the Greenwich Housing Authority. My wife, Elena, was 33 consecutive years on the RTM, District 7. I think six or seven. And so we not only are old timers here on the scene, but we paid our dues in town too. Okay, enough of that. Uh, for our first 20 years or so on Maple Avenue, it wasn't a coveted place to live. If you had, those who could afford it preferred to live in mid or back country, most people. This thinking began to change though. Uh, and now it's turned around for God's sakes. People move from back country to Maple Avenue and of course down Millbank Avenue and all around there. And they pay big, big money. They tear down houses, build new ones, renovate houses like crazy. The prices are up to $5 million. All right. Way back in the 1960s, before we got there, the owner of Maple, <coughs> a Mrs. Todd, who was somewhat famous for nobody alive, I don't know, would know her probably, but she got hard up for money, and she sold off three lots in back of her property. 94 Maple, which is the first house we bought, directly in back, 
hundred maples a little off to the side. And 92 Maple, which was a carriage house, to 96 Maple. Well, I'll show you a picture of her backyard. What was left? This driveway you see is our driveway. And her... <laughs> Her backyard is on is just in back of the back driveway. In front of the back driveway. Yeah. Oh, you don't have to. Good so you can see that's a small backyard. And on the side, the two lots, the 94 lot and the 96 lot, she sold on the southern side of her property. She sold those off for two driveways. So therefore, she reduced her side yard by 40 feet. I, I will maintain that when she sold those off, she sold off any rights to really do anything with the side and backyards of her properties. And the, and the direct backyard, which is caught as it can't be more than 30 feet. So, and let's look to the daycare center itself. This you've heard too much about already. 60 kids ranging eight months to five years. 16 caretakers, two administrators, mostly children of the academy and Brunswick teachers, parking for the adults, drop-off and pick-up areas for parents, short-term parking for miscellaneous service and other vehicles. And their guests on the north side of the property. What a load <laughs> to be asked to the already busy Maple Avenue on a historic overlay residence and a residential home in the R20 zone. My God, think of it. I mean, we've never, nobody on Maple Avenue's ever had that. When the, and when the hundred acre, when the hundred Maple Avenue, the lot next door, was created in 1962 by Mrs. Todd, the deed for the lot, and you've heard something about this, which I must talk about, created, quote, a permanent restriction to the resident to residential purposes only as a restrictive covenant which shall run with the land. Now, Respectfully, Mr. Attorney Cohen has told you, oh, that doesn't have any meaning beyond the owner of 96 and the owner of 100. Well, this is in a deed filed in the town. I've, 
I didn't come here as a lawyer. I am a lawyer, but I never practiced land law. And I, I respectfully disagree with Bruce Cohen. I think he's wrong. I think to change that, you have to go to the superior court and get it changed. Mr. Bloom. Whether um, you got consent or not. Okay. All right. You know, you've heard that. Now you got the other side. Uh, and we feel, ending, we feel strongly that the proposed daycare used for 96 Maple is not appropriate for this R20 residential neighborhood and should not be and should be denied. We recommend residential use, even if it's more than two units. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, Mrs. Fox, if you're ready, and we don't need to tell you that if you're repeating all the points that have been well made. We can, yes. We can pass those few. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can, we'll happily help you save time. <coughs> the night is getting long. Good evening. Uh, my name is Diane Fox, and I'm working with um, Attorney Fulton and representing some of the neighbors. Um, what I have presented to you are a couple of different points, as well as um, regurgitation of some of the ones that you've already had. The first thing I would say is the conversion of residential uses in the R20 zone. On your last page of the handout, I gave you a list of the historic overlays in the HROs. There are 24 properties with the historic overlay in Greenwich. Of those, eight are in residential zones and have residential uses. The commission, <coughs> excuse me, the commission has never granted other primary uses on these residential properties <coughs> other than residential uses. No conversions from residential uses have been permitted. So there's been a consistent history. This would be the first time that would change. <coughs> Um, even on the uh, other properties, the one recently that you just uh, approved, and that was the mill, went from offices to residential. You made a finding at that time that such a conversion, again, that was a commercial zone, not a residential zone, uh, resulted in less traffic and less intense use. So I think that's sort of a standard that you have now created. Um, incentives, and I also will point out the 6-109-D5 that in as has been say, stated by uh, Attorney Fulton and Attorney Haslin, that that's the governing section of the regulation. And it has to be within 1,000 feet of a business zone, less than 1,000 feet, which this is not. Um, 96 Maple Street is outside that 1,000 um, feet. And what it says, basically, therefore permitted uses formally by a special exception, now a special permit, cannot be done for educational purposes. Section 109D5 also refers to parking requirements, which shall be met per the Division 15, and parking in the front yard is discouraged. There is parking in the required front yard of this setback. Section 158, nursery school parking, states that there needs to be one space per employee staff and adequate drop-off area as determined by the commission. The applicant states that presently there is 18 staff, 10 drop-off spaces they were going to continue the same thing. However, they were only having 17 parking spaces and six queuing. So technically, a total of 23 spaces as compared to the 28 needed, what they already have now. Since the applicant cannot meet all the required parking on site, only four spaces for administrative staff are being provided, 14 spaces will be located on the main campus, further down on North Maple, as permitted by Section 6158A within 1,000 feet under the same ownership. So that's recognized. Questions arrive, however, on the logistics of the traffic movements in and out of the site, particularly if you're coming from the south of uh, Maple Avenue trying to make a left-hand turn into the site. Um, that's one of the configurations you may want to ask for more detailed information on. And also, from what I heard tonight at least, if the faculty who have the children are going to be doing shuttles from the GA main campus to this site, 
after they've parked, that means they're carrying children with them, or do they go to the 96 Maple, drop off the children, and then go back, and then shuttle back? It's, it wasn't quite clear to me which way this logistical program would work. Further, the applicant is also proposing using 19 spaces at Brunswick School. This property is not owned by GA, and therefore this parking cannot meet the requirements of Section 158A. The use of the Brunswick School parking may impact both the approved site plan conditions by the Commission at Brunswick School and Site Plan 1393 and the Board of Appeals 7647. Mm -hmm. um, the letter that I have in front of me was addressed to uh, Paul Lynch, Board of Appeals, 1992, and it was a letter from this Commission to the Board of Appeals indicating... We don't have that, that in our record. I'll be happy to Thank you. drop it off. Um, wonderful microfilm. Anyway, uh, basically there were conditions at that time that were put on the number of parking spaces for the lower school, for the upper school, and the cap on the number of students at Brunswick. There was a total of 54 or 56 parking spaces that were required, and they were divided between those two upper and lower schools. So the question then for becomes, where are these 19 parking spaces that are in excess of what the requirements were for Brunswick? If those requirements, so far as I've been able to do the research, have not changed, then the question becomes, are we double dipping into the same parking spaces? Gotcha. Um, number two, there are also no plan to show where those 19 spaces are. Um, I would assume that'd be the closest thing to this 96, but I think we need to see that. There were buses parked there, by the way, during the day and at night. So it's unclear to me where all this parking is going to be coming from. Another section of this, uh, the standard 6109C um, has to do with <coughs> the fact that the house was the house at 100 Maple was built in the 1960s. So we cannot, in a sense, allow the HO to superimpose onto 100 Maple Avenue because that structure would not meet the requirements. Then there's the subdivision issue. The lot merger proposed for 96 and 100 Maple would still leave the two zones that was pointed out and with a very odd configuration of the zones. Um, it is noted that the Maple Avenue property, 100, is legally non-conforming in lot area for the R20 zone. And the merge of the two lots does not correct that non-conformity at all. So that all stays. So this merger is a little, I won't say questionable, but it's confusing because then you have two zones and you have one of those zones, the R20, being still a non-conforming lot. So does it really truly merge is the question. The further question arises that uh, having a playground at 100 uh, Maple Avenue, does this in and of itself require a special permit just to have an educational, institutional use playground on a separate R20 property? And that has not been addressed. So I would just ask that perhaps some of these questions could be addressed. Thank, Thank you very much. Who's next? Uh, Bill Galvin. Everyone as tired as I am. No, we have another six applications I after know, this. I know, I know how you sat through them yesterday. Uh, good evening. I'm Bill Galvin. Um, I'm an RTM uh, member, uh, District 7, uh, and I'm on the Wetlands Agency for more than a dozen years. So. I was interested in the uh, drainage report for this property as well. Uh, I live at 136 Maple Avenue, and for those of you who don't know this neighborhood uh, intimately, I live on the corner of Patterson Avenue at the intersection of North Street, North Maple, Patterson, and Maple. So, because it's an odd intersection. Um, and I'm about equidistant between the main campus of GA and the uh, proposed uh, property at 96 and 100 Maple. Uh, my three sons went to Brunswick, my daughter went to GA, I've lived in Greenwich since 1971, and I've lived in this home for 20 years. Uh, as a result, I would say I have a reasonably good understanding of uh, the character and the detail of this neighborhood, and specifically the traffic around this particular intersection and the stretch of highway. Um, one thing I w would like to do, and you've heard so much detail this evening, so many numbers, so many references to various um, legal decisions and documentation within your own regulations, just to take this up to the 50,000 foot level. Um, I think this entire project is driven by 
Greenwich Academy's desire, and it was stated literally tonight, to leverage their FAR on the main campus. That's why they want to get the Cowan Center off the main campus and put it someplace. Coincidentally, they also happen to have bought this property at 96 and 100, and I think they d did it on the assumption, probably with a lot of research, but still an assumption that getting it approved for school use would be no problem. Yes, they'd have to go through multiple hearings, get multiple approvals, but it would take time. Enough experts would be called in. We'll get it done. My sense is that's behind what's been going on here. Now, while GA has been in and around this neighborhood since its founding in 1826, and you know it's been in the forefront of girls' education, it is highly respected, and it's been highly respected for years and produces wonderful results for the students. But I think it's a bit disingenuous for Mr. Cohen GA's advisor to say that the extent of GA's, this is a quote, the extent of GA's reach in the neighborhood is not much different than it was in 1950, almost 80 years ago. That's a direct quote from one of the documents that's been in circulation. This is materially incorrect and misleading in that in that period of time, GA has acquired at least a dozen residential properties and other properties, such as the ones up on Ridgeview more recently, and, has, and also has added significant increases during this time period to the number of students, the size of the, main, of the facility on the main campus, the physical plant on, at 200 North Maple. So there's been a lot of change. GA already has a significant institutional presence in this resi residential neighborhood. That's an important element. They're already there and they've been there for a long time. There has also been the repeated assertion, and this was referenced earlier, just to make the point, that Maple Avenue, and this is a quote again, has embraced some of the more commercial characteristics of Putnam. I think we've heard enough about the fact that uh, uh, this is fundamentally a residential area that has been unchanged uh, in that character for more than 40 years. Now, the future implications of, of a zoning approval here to combine 96 and 100, uh, which would enable a daycare center to be moved into this reg residential neighborhood, that would materially, markedly accelerate the degradation of the neighborhood character of Greenwich. Because if it can happen here, if this kind of zoning adjustment, as was just said by Diane Fox, can happen here implicitly, it can happen in other places. I don't think that's what is intended by the regulations. And some of the key information in support of the proposal is flawed, it's misleading, and it's often wrong. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. Traffic. GA's traffic study says the proposed move is, and this is a quote, is not expected to materially alter area traffic operating conditions. Well, knowing where I live on the corner of Patterson and, and Maple, I get the paper every day with my two golden retrievers between 7, 7.15. Today, the traffic at that time period, because I purposely counted knowing I'd be here tonight, the traffic down Patterson was more than 15 cars. The traffic up North Street wrapped around the corner so I couldn't see beyond 14 cars. The traffic stopped at the intersection. Down Maple was 13 cars. And there was essentially gridlock going through the intersection. That was today. OK, it was raining. Let's make a 10% adjustment on all those numbers for a sunny day. Same point. It is this intersection, this traffic area, the other point, and it was a just repeat a point, the North Maple stretch from that intersection to the main campus is a local feeder road winding hilly. From that intersection south to the post road, as my wife indicated, 
is a highly trafficked, busy commercial artery. If you will go to the Merritt Parkway, the sign indicating business district for Greenwich is at the North Street exit. So it is the main feeder. And to that traffic flow from the intersection southbound, they want to have this prospective column center traffic. Um, the traffic consultant, we've already discussed this, found some inconsistencies. Another element, the, the whole detail, and again, you can get lost in the detail, but think about it just intuitively. There are about a third of the students at the Cowan Center today, based on the statistics that have been handed out part of this proposal, about a third of the students are a year old or younger. These kids, it, this is not like dropping off a UPS package. And we think that these, these drop-offs are going to run smoothly, and at worst, there's going to be queuing of seven cars. There's a dramatic distinction between the operation of the Cowan Center, where it is today, which is a controlled environment. If five cars back up or 15 cars back up, it's on the GA property. If more than three or four cars back up in the proposed property, they're going to be backing up onto Maple Avenue. They're going to be backing up next to the Brunswick parking lot, which is, what is it, 116 Maple. Um, that parking lot, most mornings, has a policeman directing traffic. Now, you're just adding complexity to an already busy situation. It makes no sense. Another point. The Town of Greenwich regulations. One of the zoning regs states the proposed development should be in harmony and scale with the existing neighborhood. Daycare is an employee benefit. Having 60 kids, 18 caregivers, multiple drop-offs, in and out traffic, that is no benefit to the neighborhood. Let's distinguish the interests here. I understand GA's need, and based on the early presentation by one of the GA people, I mean, I hope my younger, youngest grandchildren could go to the Cowan Center because the services are spectacular. That's not the issue. The, the complexity of that project as it relates to the neighborhood, the traffic, and all of the associated issues, above and beyond all of the particular zoning regs that you're dealing with, just makes this untenable, in my opinion. Finally, I'd like to talk about the Pinocchio Award. One of the 96 Maple justifications put forth by Mr. Cohen to T&Z in a letter dated October 26th of 18, quote, this project, quote, will breathe new life into a building that has been vacant for more than a year and allowed to deteriorate, end quote. It is worth noting that GA's residential property at 2 Patterson Avenue, the corner of Patterson and North Maple, right opposite my driveway, that property um, was the subject of a P&Z hearing in July of 2009. Mr. Cohen said at that time, quote, the school maintains its properties, all of its properties, beautifully. I don't think the neighbors ever have had a cause to complain about the school allowing its buildings to become derelict, and that won't happen to this property either." Close quote. The property at 2 Patterson, aka in the neighborhood known as the Ghost House, has been vacant for nine years, totally not maintained, and is now, as you heard and you will see in the main campus presentation that you have not yet addressed, that property is scheduled for demolition. So in essence, that's going to be demolition by abandonment. It's going to fit into their master plan. Now, I put all these points out here just to paint a broader picture. GA is a fine institution, extraordinarily well-financed educational facility, they have great results. But contributing the, to the decline of a historic residential neighborhood 
should not become part of its legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Galvin. <laughs> Louis Perkins. And if you don't mind my asking you this, yeah, if you've got Pretty thunder, yeah, yield it, but you know people have made great points all I'll night be very on quick. both sides. Um, my name's Louis Perkins. Um, we bought uh, two Boxwood Lane, which is kind of behind the property um, here. Um, one quick point I want to make just about that, they're basically between Brunswick and where the church is, there's basically seven residential properties um, in that area before they bought those two properties at 96 and 100. So now there's five left. Three of them are owned by the Blooms. And there's us, and then there's um, the people on the end. Uh, <clears throat> Pearsons. So on that side of the street, it now is now owned to five properties. The ones owned by the Blooms, realistically, nobody wants to buy those now. The value is only going to go to Greenwich Academy. So from our perspective, we just see that all of a sudden, they're going to take over at least two of those Probably one will be left over to some random person. There's going to be like two of us on that side. So, I mean, the points about, I don't agree with the whole, it's a commercial area. Not at all. It's residential. However, if you agree with some of that stuff, you want to preserve what you have. That's not a thing. Just, oh, let's just go throw it away. Let's keep it. It's not just, you know, it's ridiculous. Um, other thing I want to just point out was I thought the teacher made fantastic argument just to keep everything on the campus. She kept talking, and it was just like, yeah, this is fantastic. Keep it there. I mean, that's what I would thought. We have a two-year-old. It's like, I love the idea of them getting to see the older kids go around and everything. It's wonderful. And then it's just, yeah, let's put it here. I mean, this is a 0.6-acre property. Their campus is 39 acres. And you're going to move all these things. And it's like, the, I heard nothing beyond we have we need for facilities. And uh, like, what is it? The teacher, um, they need teacher housing. This is not going to help with teacher housing at all. Uh, they still have three. If they don't do this, they still have three. There's no benefit. So, I mean, if they, I understand if they came here and they said, we need to convert this to like nine teachers. We're desperate for teacher housing. That at least makes some logical sense. I may oppose it or whatever, but at least this doesn't make any sense on any sort of, sort of thing. For the kids, for beyond just sort of a planning thing, we maximize FAR or whatever. So, that's just, we're new to the neighborhood. We got a little kid. We want to stay there for a long time. So, you know, um, that's just our perspective. So. Thanks. It's a good one. Emily Cox. Yeah, we'll just wait. Yeah, and Ms. Cox, you know, I know. Point at it's very late. At night, we're saying to people, make well, the point. Yes. And my name is Emily Cox, Emily Ford Cox. I am a Gre Greenwich Academy graduate, very proud to say that. I am a Greenwich resident. And the Academy always has taken pride in standing for integrity, honor, and promoting the best for girls and women's education. And I'm, I'm not going to read the rest of, much of the rest I, I wrote. However, um, providing the daycare primarily for the children of Greenwich Academy's working women faculty and their families is of huge benefit to, Greenwich, to the Greenwich Academy as a whole. It speaks volumes in supporting women at different stages in their lives, single, married, mothers, and mothers with careers outside the family. And the appropriate placement of the Cowan Center is crucial, and that's what I, I thank you all for your hours that you spend, and thank you for letting us speak, because I think the point is not to be for or against, we want to get the right decision here. Um, for the children and for the families and for Greenwich. Um, it's surprising to hear um, Ms. King talk down the, Cowan, the present Cowan Center because when you go to the website, uh, they say the Greenwich Academy website states the benefits of the present location. The Cowan, and I quote, the Cowan Center is located on the campus of Greenwich Academy which allows a wide variety of activities and experiences to be part of each child's daily routine. And then there are a couple of sentences, and then it says, in addition to the Acad Greenwich Academy campus facilities, the center is surrounded by three playgrounds which offer children abundant opportunity for outdoor play and exploration. I did talk about the 60 children and the 60 potential drivers coming in and out, so I won't go over that again. 
And then number three, the relocation of the Cowan Center to 96 and 100 Maple Avenue eliminates the easy access of the children and their, their parent teacher, a benefit which they enjoy on the main campus. And that was so well addressed by our, the sixth grade teacher. But as Mr. Gavin said, we're not leaving off a sack of potatoes or, or whatever. You imagine, um, and now they're going to start at 7 o'clock. So arriving at 7 a.m. means families have to be up very early, especially if they do not live in Greenwich, rushing to eat, dress, get in the car, drive to the Cowan Center, park their cars, walk the children in, or maybe hand them over to the person in the port cashier, and then make sure that their child is settled, rush back to the car, maybe drive right out, or wait in a line, and then make the left-hand turn across Maple Avenue to head down to the main campus. And that's what I just, I don't see how that is gonna keep that flow. It's taken, I've lived here, I'm 66, I've lived here much of my life and seen that intersection with all the different choices that have been made. And this has been a great improvement, it works well. So, and so um, relocating the Cowan Center requires this zoning change. We need, uh, there's a shortage, as has been said, of the af affordable housing for teachers. Why not just maintain the present use and use it for that and keep the Cowan Center? It, maybe they have to build a new facility, but keep it on the main campus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Doreen Pearson. Good evening. I can only thank you for your many hours of work. Doreen Pearson, 64 Maple Avenue, and also 76 Maple Avenue, and another residential lot, undeveloped. If I could just, wow, what I'm, I'm trying. This is I'm trying to be organized and do this quickly. First, I'd like to present this petition that uh, it, it represents many hours. I wanted Katie to have the other. Yeah, I, I, that was done in a day and a half, but I had. I have the pulse of Maple Avenue because I spent a lot of time explaining and bringing p people up to snuff on this. This chart where they're claiming uh, institutional use represents all or most all of the residential homes on Greenwich Avenue. All the stately large homes that everyone Excuse thinks. Excuse me, did you mean on Greenwich Avenue? I, I'm sorry, on Maple Avenue, on Maple Avenue. Yeah, okay. Um, all the stately homes, old and new, which there are several new stately high-priced homes. There's 77 Maple which is a, a residential property directly across from the Stanton House. The Stanton House is historically, legally non-conforming. It has never stepped out the boundaries of that particular zoning regulation. We are not a hotel. We are a small boutique bed and breakfast. That's what we have strived to be. We fit into the neighborhood well because the use is residential. When Bruce Cohen talks about the swimming pool, we sacrificed our own front yard to add that as an amenity for ourselves and for the inn. <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't want to have to go over all of these, but these properties at the beginning 
of Maple Avenue off of Route 1 represent properties on the National Historic Register. Greenwich may be the gateway to New England, but Maple Avenue is the gateway to Greenwich. That short distance from that very busy intersection out to the Post Road represents Horseneck, which was the original center of Greenwich. Horseneck exists, I'm sorry, I had pictures, but they got lost today. The first property is a town park with historic, nas national historic registry. It has a Civil War monument, it has a colonist monument, and it is the original site of the first town hall in Greenwich, Hortzneck. Inside, on the opposite side, is the uh, Second Congregational Church, which um, also, dating back to 1979, is on the National Historic Registry. The Solomon Mead House at 48 Maple, 1858, is also on the National Historic Registry. 24 Maple at the Second Congo, the two-family residential parsonage is on the National Historic Registry. These designate properties already on the National Historic Registry. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, at, at Second Congregational Church in the Mead Parish House, there is an organization that's called Aid At Home in Greenwich, which is, supports people trying to age in place. Okay? Behind uh, this other uh, institutional uh, use, which is the Women's Club. The Women's Club has been there since 1906. Uh, they are, are historically non-conforming. Meals on Wheels operates for a long time out of the back of um, that parking lot. They no longer have food delivered there. I mean, they no longer prepare food there. They have it delivered. And their delivery com comes about the same time as all of this commotion that will be going on on Maple Avenue. Their driveway is pretty much opposite where that comes out. Currently, there are at least 40 Brunswick student cars that park behind the women's club. Currently, there are about 30 Greenwich Academy cars that park behind the Second Congregational Church. This is because they do not have enough parking. Under any circumstances, they don't have enough parking. Um, you can all, I, I can leave this up, you can all look at it closely. You've presented it, Katie has to keep it. I, she'll give it back to you one day. Okay. But she, okay. she has to keep it for the record until this matter is done and gone. Sure. Because it's a sure. part of our record. It's impressive. I think I just yeah, turned this off. Good. It represents a lot of hours of work. It's beautiful. But I, I, and, and this was a neighborhood effort. This was just not only my effort. I'm presenting this as support for all the neighbors yeah. that have signed a petition, uh, which you have now. Um, and so you know, we normally do, somebody asked us tonight, we do drive around and look at the sites when we have applications. So my guess is most of us have been on Maple in the last- Have you been place. down all the right of ways, all the flag lots? Uh, no, we drive and we look at where the application is, but just so you know, we do try to get familiar. So, it, and plus we live here, so. But yeah, I, but I, I don't think anyone really actually knows what's on Maple Avenue and what our Maple Avenue address is. So go ahead. Um, so we get to keep that for at least for a while. Okay. But we know that you're going to want it back. Okay. Okay. And go on. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that the inn is, of course, 
historically plaqued by the town were not um, nationally on any Connecticut registry, but we are plaqued by the town. We're the Brush Seaman Sackett House, plaqued by the Greenwich Historic Society in 1990. Our, our date is 1843, the original. Okay, so we uh, were before Harry's house next door. Um, there are also, I, I put the other plaqued houses by the Greenwich Historic, Historic Society. They just have half stars. So that's the Galvin's property, who you so eloquently heard from tonight. Uh, that is, um, What's our? Yeah, Galvin's are 136. The Ho Horse property, which is a lovely plaqued single family residence at 107 Maple Avenue, they just have half stars, so you'll know. Actually, the mixed use on the corner, Coleman's, is also on the National Historic Registry. The large mistake that the town made was a special permit years ago when they allowed the Coleman's to build uh, to the corner at 11 Maple Avenue. This picture is the result of a really bad decision. The neighbors fought it, the neighbors lost. This was the last special exception. If you want to just pass that along. Yeah. The only other special exceptions on Maple Avenue in recent memory, and we've all been there a long time. Um, we've been there almost as long as the blooms. Um, the only exception was the Brunswick School. And that created uh, a lot of um, bad feeling. The other point, and I have pictures to demonstrate it. I don't know if I want to show you because I'm, I don't want to donate my book. But I have, <laughs> I have pictures of where Greenwich Academy first existed. Greenwich Academy first existed right where that ugly exception to zoning is now. That was Greenwich Academy's first building. I have pictures showing it behind the monument. So where you're heading is that this is a residential and historic community it's that retains its character. It's a very important okay. historic community. Got that. Um, and, and you wanted us to, and you're going to leave that with us. I will. Okay. And it's residential. Yeah. I have two other points to make okay, briefly. Great. Go ahead, yes. I would like to challenge the environmental studies that uh, were turned into the town okay. about the porosity of Harry Costa's property. You know, we're on a very high point. Water flows downhill. And uh, I happen to know the Kinahans had a sump pump in their basement. They already had water issues. Okay, so we'll pass that on to DPW. And Could you please? Yes. And we're having some water issues off of Boxwood Lane from seepage from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, she's got one more point, I think. Oh, just those two. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm worried about the air pollution right now, too. I walk by Brunswick's parking lot with all those buses idling down there. If you could have seen it this morning with uh, exhaust spewing out onto the sidewalk, I don't know why you'd want to put small children in a facility right alongside of that. Okay. Great. Okay. So the drainage and the, and the buses. And so the air quality. And the air quality. Tog Pearson. Are you seating I, to the Are you seating to the boss or I, I am going to yield. I think okay. she's made every point that we want to make and I just want to add my voice to the opposition. Great. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Thank you. Uh, Colin Pearson? I'm I'm going to see my I'm really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it's 11:15. And Baron Schneider. Great. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Okay, so you give that to, you fold it up and you deliver that to Katie. And we've gone through our list, so if I can locate Mr. Cohen for his rebuttal. And so, um, Mr. Cohen, just before you start, there were a couple of points and um, we'll, do, we'll address the DPW and the drainage, um, but there was a point about you integrating into your presentation the Brunswick, whatever, uh, addressing whether or not, or really should we do that, Katie? Yeah, because it really, it's not his client. Right. Okay. So just to, and on the, just to ask Mr. Canning to look at the traffic coming up from the south of Maple, and that turns and I think those were the two things that I wrote down that we actually hadn't touched on I so heard Mr. Canning making detailed notes detailed notes as uh, he heard the traffic and parking yes. comments great and, and he'll make a submission. yes I assume this will be left open your uh, decision Mr. Cohn hmm? yes you you would like to leave this open well to provide what you've requested and what we can really give you yes uh, and so we're going to need just to get to get that. Um, you need an extension on the subdivision, and we'll we'll we have it for you. Okay. Uh, really, just briefly to respond to a couple of points that uh, that w were made, um, the whole issue of <laughs> is this a residential neighborhood or is it an institutional neighborhood? Uh, it, you know, um, it, it kind of depends on uh, who's saying it at what time they're saying it. Uh, and how they view it. And, and I'm sure that the folks uh, who live there feel it's a residential neighborhood. It is a residential neighborhood, but it's clearly also an institutional neighborhood. Um, uh, Mrs. Pearson uh, talked in detail about that. She talked about her little hotel. She, the, the hotel is being marketed very actively online. I'm going to leave uh, with the staff the, their website showing uh, how eager they are to rent these 20 rooms and I would also point out that the uh, the owners of the uh, uh, Stan, uh, Stan, Stan House uh, Inn um, took quite a different view of uh, the nature of the neighborhood uh, when they applied uh, really before 1979 for a variance to allow a um, 25 doctor medical building to be built where on the site, on the site uh, that the pool is now located. And I think it's interesting because the basis of the variance that the uh, Q Corporation, which was the Pearson family company, uh, stated at that time in their appeal to the Board of Appeals as the, their hardship is the following. Property is located in a residential zone which has developed in a non-residential character. Since other properties have developed in a non-residential manner, it is not reasonable to require this property, namely that portion where the pool is now located, to be so developed. Uh, th that uh, basis of hardship was not considered by the Board of Appeals to be satisfactory uh, uh, as a legal hardship. But I think really the best evidence of the nature of the, uh, of the neighborhood and the extent to which the plan that we presented to you for restoration and use of the, of the uh, uh, 96 and 100 Maple Avenue, whether or not that represents an incursion into a residential neighborhood, is found in the map that your own staff prepared and is dis distributed to you showing the areas in that Maple Avenue uh, location that's currently located, uh, uh, occupied uh, by uh, institutional uses, and it's considerable. Um, but as I say, it's in the eye of the beholder at, at any particular time, depending on what uh, they may be seeking. Uh, I would like to uh, address the uh, point that... Uh, uh, Mr. Fulton? Fulton uh, made, yeah, let me just pull out
Uh, Mr. Fulton and uh, Ms. Fox also quoted uh, two sections of 109. Uh, one section I think is clearly inapplicable, and as you pointed out, Ms. Albin, and that is uh, 109D. 109D, which is the uh, uh, provision that uh, talks about, uh, uh, oh, thank you. Incentives reads as follows. To provide incentives to protect historic resources, the Planning and Zoning Commission may allow the following modifications of the building zone regulations. And then it talks about uh, uh, for structures on, I, I, on the uh, R, uh, residential zones, Planning and Zoning Commission may authorize, uh, and so on. Uh, th these are clearly incentives. This is not the provision under which we're applying. We're applying not to modify the building zone regulations, but to avail ourselves of the explicit provisions of permitted uses under 94A. Number one. Number two, Mr. Uh, Fulton also referred to C. 109C talked about, and, and I think uh, Mr. McRae pointed this out, talks about standards when considering an application for an HO zone. However, in this regard, I, I would agree with Mr. Fulton. I think that these standards are not totally inapplicable because, in, in fact, in, in, under the provision that we were referred to the HDC on, which is uh, alterations and additions, the standards of 109C are, in fact, applicable. So let's take a quick look at those standards. Um, Mr. Cohen. Uh, just what I'd like to request of you, uh, understanding that. What I'd like to request of you, of because uh, it's such late hour, can you provide us a brief yes. on this, these, those two issues specifically, the, um, those two sections of six one zero nine. Terrific idea. I'll um, do I would that. like to very much understand the the, the setback issue, the thousand foot thing, um, sure. and how you interpret that. Uh, in comparison to Mr. Fulton Absolutely. and the, the standards, because uh, the way I see it is different. And I want to make sure that I understand both sides of this argument. And while you're at it, um, the point that was raised about, because it's not in your, in your discussion, uh, the point that's raised about when you add, when you merge the, in your rezoning application, when, and I'm sorry, in the, the subdivision application, when you add this property, what do you do with the HO and how do you propose to, how do you believe that that applies? The point that was raised by Mrs. Fox as well as Mr. Fulton. The, the point having to do with the split zoning? Yeah. Uh, the split zoning is, you could is, address that is in not the unusual in, in uh, this town. In fact, the Greenwich Academy main, main campus has a split zone. Part of it's uh, R20, part of it's RA1. I, but I this think is it's on a, the HO specifically. I think inclusive in your brief is, I think what we're looking for is how the, we have an HO on one piece of property, nothing on another. Now that you're, when you merge them, uh, what's the status of the HO? Why doesn't it extend to the other piece of property? That kind of thing. Doesn't it? I'll be glad to do that. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, why doesn't it? Why does it? So on and so forth. It doesn't because the, other parcel doesn't qualify, but I'll put that in a, a letter. Finally, yes. the, on the issue of, uh, of whether or not this is legal under 109, I'd point out that uh, the commission got a report from the zoning enforcement officer that did not note any zoning violation under that provision. And I would point out to you that the commission is responsible for the interpretation of its regulations regardless. Just saying. Just say it. I will get you a, a letter as Thank you, you sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we get an extension for the um, subdivision app. I want to, uh, Mr. Cohn, I'm sure you've, your staff's heard this. That um, I think we wanted to confirm the breakdown of the enrollment, the uh, the 27 19 14 thing. Um, 
I think actually you had mentioned the ITE baseline for Mr. Canning. I think Mr. Canning's yeah, got he's that. He's got that. He's all over it. Uh, he knows what we we'll, want. We'll clarify those numbers. Okay, and okay. actually, uh, um, information from the staff reports, uh, a die test from the sewer department, uh, conservation, so on and so forth. There are issues. Oh, the sewer departments yeah. are, are Later. perfectly Later. fine. Later. Okay. We'll get there. Thank you, okay. Mr. Cohn. Um, so while the room is being emptied, how about a quick break? But let's. So we can go home because we got six more applications to do tonight. Heard the rest of the commission hasn't heard it yet. So. Oh, yeah, because I couldn't turn, we can't turn them both on at the same time. Sorry. Okay, so we got a little hung up last time on the fact that there's that illegal, there's that use that isn't approved where you are. But as, we, as I thought about it, that's not fair to you. You are coming in with an application that should just look at what, assuming that everybody else that's there is okay. I think I said that. So... Bottom line, where I'm coming out is that right now, if where the Corp Pilates was, was re retail, and where the space you want to go into was retail, if those were retail, 63 spaces would be needed in total. When you go into the space next to you, the requirement goes down by one space. So you would be reducing the nonconformity, which is all we really care about, is to not have stuff breaking our regulations. So where, we, where I'm coming out is that your application to move into that space reduces the nonconformity, and therefore we could approve it. However, in doing that, you made, a, you made some suggestions that make a lot of sense, which is to not open your space until 6 30 p.m yeah that's right because it does look um the staff did charts for us that showed when the parking gets tight and it does look theoretically like there's going to be times if you're doing well like it'll be tight um the, the you open at three if you were to fill up at three with all the other businesses doing what they're doing there wouldn't be enough parking and the other time we saw that you could run out of spaces would be Saturday during the day. But from your point of view, you're applying for something that reduces the demand. So I'm seeing that we could approve it. And if these guys agree. Well, yeah, I think Saturday. My issue is it's the landlord's problem. Not and, his. And not, not his. your problem. But, but we hey, can't but do the regulations that way. We have to do it by the book, and by the book but, it works. We but, can make it work. But how do we have enforcement action on the non-permitted use? But it has nothing to do with what... It is. The applicant's the landlord. It's not the tenant. But we can't consider... No, the tenant is, existing... represent, is representing the landlord here. Yeah, we can't consider yeah. an existing violation in an application. If the tenant has a lease, he's representing the landlord. So the fact that there is an existing we violation, we can't consider and be punitive to this one. But having said that, the, that place does it's have being, a violation. And, and they're being addressed. certainly discuss this with the landlord when they come in for zoning permit for the other one about what's happening. I think an opposite way to look at this is that when the violator comes in it's going to be evaluated at that point in time so at this point in time we have to act like it's it's no, not there it's just not there yeah. and then treat this one with that being an item that we'll address later on and i think actually andy to your point about the landlord problem i, I think it's the, it's yes it's the landlord problem if the landlord has rented a space to a uh, non-compliant use He's actually just shooting himself in the foot because he's turning away patrons that are actually to the other stores because there's no parking for it. He's got to figure that out, as you said, to make it work for the available parking that he has. 
with this use as we have it here, it's actually it's approvable because it's it's lessening the nonconformity. Now, when the Pilates, bit, but it, we should it have the lease. Do, do we have the lease? No, but he doesn't. So when the Pilates place comes in, they're going to have a problem because there's nonconforming parking, and they're going to have to work around his hours now. They're going to have to make sure they work under the, under the restaurants. They've got to get around now the restaurants' demand. So when they finally do come in to rectify their violation, it's their job to. F and currently, all their classes are in the morning. Um, right. So, the the. Park. Oh, sorry, Benjamin McCarthy. Yeah, see, we're, it's a snag for you, and again, not an issue. It's 8.30 to 12. They're open 8.30 to 12 on Saturday. Yeah. So, and that is when everything's open on the site, and if you were slamming people in, into your place, you would have a problem with parking. Yeah, but Mar Margarita, on Saturday, you've got the whole Oak, Old Greenwich train station. Yeah, and people parking. can park it, exactly. But we can't count that because it's not in their control. <laughs> so we have to make the Pilates work with your hours, with the social club's hours. We, yeah, we can also because we can't consider not open that, that when building we, when we consider the Pilates. So we only can focus on what's on the property, even though we realistically know people can park at the train station. So if you're okay with it after sitting here for all these hours, we could close it. Do you all agree with this? Um, I think we're talking about the no no use of the overflow space until after 6.30. 6.30, and that's what he offered. Okay. Uh, we've got the count of 20 at the bar, 122 total. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a discussion about the resident opening at 5.30. We're taking that off the table. And, um, you know, you may find that opening at 3 is kind of early. That's We would ask you to consider to maybe open a little later, like at 5.00. The on current weekdays, restaurant or the yeah, new the, space? In general, no, the, new, the current restaurant because I'm not sure you get many people, but that's your business. We, we're not going to tell you. We're what, just going to ask you to consider. Monday through Friday, you mean? Monday through Friday at, at 5 instead of 3. They're not open for lunch? Uh, I don't open for lunch? Uh, I actually don't know. I think he's just open for lunch on the weekends. Yeah, that's, the, that's what we got, that his hours are 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And yeah. 3 p.m. to 2 a.m. on Friday. Yeah, that's Friday. correct. Yeah, that is so correct. So he's not open for lunch, and um, it's just I'm not sure he gets much business at three. No, you can see by the parking charts he doesn't get much business well, until the, the, about. The parking chart, we just made it toad. Yeah. Okay. So we would ask him to consider. We ask that they consider opening a little later than three, just to ease it, but not a requirement. Um, I don't have anything else except that. Um, it goes to two, and the, the condition that remains in place is that when the outside dining comes in at the beginning of the season, that's 12 seats, and they have to remove 12 in, inside seats, and that's always existed, yeah, that condition, existed and the before. outside dining has always existed. Um, and you're adding um, 14 seats for a total of going from 108 to 122, which would... Um, which with the outside dining, oh no, doesn't count. It's 108 to 122. Okay. Okay, so you're good. I mean, it paid. Yeah. Sit here. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> so can we close it? Close, close, okay. All right, you have two minutes. Don't forget about the fee schedule. Oh. Somebody we'll move. We'll start with that. Start with that. And um, so ends the public hearing. So I made my promise to you, just not to them. I told you we'd be, at, we'd, be we'd get you out of here by 1 a.m. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. I moved the meeting minutes from 12, 18, 18 as submitted. Peter. Second. Um, minutes were moved. Andy, Andy moved it. Peter seconded it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. The next one is the um, fee schedule. Uh, move to approve uh, Planning and Zoning Commission fee schedule for 2019 as amended. Second. Peter Levy seconds. Mac Wright makes the motion. All in favor? Aye. Okay. And now, Mr. Mac Wright, you are uh, really on. Let's go backwards. Um, 
Item number 13, uh, PLPZ 2018-00436 and 00437, site plan, final site plan and special permit expanded restaurant. Uh, motion to approve application, uh, providing that there is 100 existing, 108 existing uh, parking spaces, uh, uh, seats in the space that will now uh, increase to 122 spaces. Uh, the applicant has agreed uh, that the overflow space will not be used until 6.30 p.m. Uh, the outside dining, as uh, dictated, um, <clears throat> 12, seats. 12 seats outside will eliminate 12 seats inside at that time. Uh, the applicant will consider opening uh, later than 3 p.m. Monday uh, through Friday. Monday through Friday. Shh. Uh, Nick's trying to think. And I think that's all I have on that one. And so the um, the commission finds that this application reduces um, the existing nonconformity um, in the parking um, by one space, and um, and that's why. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Do we have a second? Second. And our next one is going to be the card. Oh, sorry, guys. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the next one, you want to do West Putt? Mr. Nick? Okay, so while you're getting it out, um, this is for an application at 366 West Putt. It's a final site plan and special permit. Um, uh, the um, 366 West Putnam, 366 West Open Avenue, okay. <clears throat> uh, 30 Columbus Avenue, PLPZ 2018 421 and 422. Uh, demolished existing building, construct a new two-story automotive showroom. Okay, before you get to that, I'm going to go real quick. Um, the um, ARC comments of 4418 are to be concluded and have been addressed. The ZEO uh, notes that they were granted the front yard setbacks and um, a special exception with condition on the lights, the timing of the lights and their intensity, which the applicant has included in their plan. And um, the applicant has responded to conservation's request for additional planting. The, um, the Department of Public Works Engineering has endorsed uh, the drainage plan with the uh, amended best management practices, and the applicant has opted um, to choose one of the options given to them by the traffic department uh, on the egress. Egress? And Access. then go. Okay. Access. So, um Okay, traffic flow, uh, as indicated on in a revised plan, has been reversed. Access would be off of uh, uh, Columbus and exit on Josephine Evaristo. Um, there would be three spaces at the post road. Uh, two, two spaces would be eliminated and provided uh, space for more green space and landscaping. Uh, condition that no inventory is parked in front spaces along post road. Um, the ZBA condition on the lighting is to be included and noted on the site plan. Uh, ARC comments uh, to be addressed. Revised landscaping plan to be reviewed by staff. Yep. Re revised landscape plan to be review, reviewed by staff. And it's, right, and it's, there'll be only three parking spaces in the front. Three parking right. spaces, yes. You so. did say that, but. I believe that the parallel spaces of the street that are in the corner on the corner is Yes, yes, three parallel is is, is uh, patron, one in the corner, single year in the corner is uh, display. Well, it's, no, it's two in the front, not three. Well, yeah, right, there'll be two after they remove yeah, He agreed to remove one of them, so it's only oh, really? two in the front and then one on the corner. Which is what he agreed to. So it's, it's, it's the one inventory that's the, the angled corner thing, and then the two parallel in the front. That's the one that Peter... That's your idea. What's the, your, your discussion with them, rather? One. No, that's what it shows now, but he agreed to eliminate one of those. And Display. Oh, that's going to just be one, and then there'll be two along that strip, and then he's going to add 
landscaping where you have right there will be added landscaping and in the middle patch. See, right I there. thought he was. I thought he was keeping these three, eliminating that, and having that as display. No, there's there's only where it's hatched right there is just one display. All the others are removed, and then there's two in that in that area. And the center one is actually now landscape. Right. That's terrific. Okay, just to read. Landscape, 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 display, yeah. patron, patron. Correct. And staff yeah. to review the new and landscaping. And there's those two that are patron should really never be parked because yes. they come in and they get carted off somewhere. Right. So right. there should be no cars there. So they could do pervious. No, that changes the drainage plan. Forget it. Ice cream. Second? Second. Okay, seconded by Levy. And all in favor? Aye. Okay, our next one is Eight Round Hill Club. Eight Round, yeah, Round is, no, it was Round Hill Club, 33 Round Hill Club Road um, for a final time. site plan and special permit. Um, we have a green sheet from IWW. Um, the ARC requested an electronic return um, with some changes in the lights and the landscaping. Um, the ZEO is um, okay on the 2nd of January. DPW Engineering endorsed on the 27th of December. Conservation makes the comment that they observed that some area indicated as meadow appears manicured. And uh, the applicant will confirm that all meadow areas are in fact meadow. The health department is okay on the 4th of January. The applicant has uh, confirmed that membership does not change and remains at 600. And the um, Planning and Zoning Commission conditions the approval on the applicant receiving all the requisite state approvals um, for the pool from the state uh, public health as well as um, any other approvals that should remain outstanding. Um, I believe they have. Connecticut deep on the facility, on the flows. Yes. Um, and that's it. Sorry, Nick, I took it out, but I that's was right. ready to rock Second. and roll. Second by Andy. All in favor? Aye. Bye. Sorry, I didn't mean to take this. Yeah.